girl conference ever, first annuals and last. <laughs> but thank you everyone, especially to the girls who are coming to present today. We're still waiting for a few more. Um, but we're just grateful that you're here. I guess to start out and to thank people in advance, just in case we don't do it at the end, thank you to Garrett and Ikaika, who as you see are providing our beautiful tech support for today. Also to Sandra, who has been my tech support in the weeks prior to this. She's been a great support. Um, and also just for you guys for being here to participate. We're just gonna jump in and get started with our first speaker, who is Mary Alexis. <laughs> Oh, to Mary, <laughs> Mary Larson has been attending Utah State University since 2013. She's taken several breaks in her education, first to serve as a missionary in Lyon, France, then to work in El Salvador for a semester, and later to study Spanish in Logroño, Spain for five months. These experiences, as well as daily interactions, have solidified her desire to do something that allows her to work with people. Combined with an innate curiosity about how the world works, discovered when she dissected her first pet goldfish at age seven. She is looking to pursue a career in health. <laughs> we'll have to hear more on that later. <laughs> her specific interest is to provide medical care to those in under, underserved populations with a focus on preventative medicine. There you go. Can everyone hear me without the mic? Because I think I prefer to not use the mic. Yeah. Everyone good? OK. Um, yes, my name is Mary Larson. Um, I did dissect my first pet goldfish. My mom didn't let me use a real knife. I had to use a plastic knife. And I wrote like a little journal of like records of like what I did, what I saw, what I thought it was. I thought I found the brain. It was a cool thing. So <laughs> anyway, I knew what I wanted to do from a young age. Um, and in all my studies, I mean, the common theme is like the human body. How does it work? What is it, how does it, you know, how is it built? What does it do? Um, what can we do to avoid disease and so forth? And for me, the common message is that our bodies are miraculous. Um, there are thousands upon thousands of cells that work together to allow us to function properly. And um, I kind of want to read a scripture that I think describes my um, interpretation of the human body and its functions and how it relates to our lives. So in the Book of Mormon, Alma says, <clears throat> yea, in all things denote there is a God, Yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it. So you and I are on the face of the earth. Um, and we do um, witness that there's a supreme creator. So the way that our body works is a testimony of our creator, God. And um, in my view, it's also a testimony of the way in which we can um, act in our lives. There are so many analogies that I have found in the function of our body and in the ways that we can react in real life. The one I want to discuss today is how we can find balance. So in um, physiological terms, we talk about homeostasis. Homeostasis is really kind of a set point of balance, um, equilibrium, and harmony in our body. So when we think about all the cells that are working together, all their different functions, they each need specific levels of oxygen, mineral ions, um, waste removal and so forth in order to function properly. And we have a set limit, homeostasis, at which we want to stay. And we can fluctuate a little bit, but we kind of want to stay there to be healthy and happy. And when we have changes, that's when we encounter disease and problems. So how do we stay in homeostasis? Well, <clears throat> there are three kind of steps to it. First is the receptor, which receives information about our internal environment, assesses it, is it normal, and then based on that, sends it to the command center. Our command center, our brain, processes it, decides what needs to happen. Do we need to raise or lower that level to stay healthy? And then the effector sends the stimulus back to uh, kind of balance things out, self-regulate. So I'm going to give two examples. Um, we have two different pathways by which we self-regulate. First is the negative feedback loop. Negative feedback loop is just what it sounds like. Um, any kind of stimulus <clears throat> that we have that isn't good for our bodies, um, it will, if it's too high, attempt to lower it. If it's too low, it will attempt to higher that um, level. So one example is blood sugar regulation. When we eat a meal, imagine you've just eaten a lot of pasta, pizza, carbohydrates, 
your body converts that to glucose, which in, in turn goes into your bloodstream, and your body registers high blood glucose levels, blood sugar levels. In response to that, your pancreas will secrete the hormone insulin, which allows that sugar to be stored in your liver as glycogen, or just a storable energy form for later. So once you've regulated that, you've taken the high blood sugar levels, reduced them, negative feedback loop, and you're back to normal, and your body stops secreting insulin. So that's one example. The next pathway we have is the positive feedback loop. This is a little counterintuitive, because rather than reducing a level or raising it back to normal, this is about going beyond what's normal so that we can in turn go back to normal, if that makes sense. So one example is childbirth. As the child, the infant, moves down the birth canal, its head puts pressure on the cervix, on the woman's cervix. This pressure is obviously very uncomfortable, very painful, and normally that kind of stimulus would tell our brain, like, stop. Make this stop. We don't want to feel this pain, right? But what's interesting is that because this baby needs to come out, that's part of the process to come back to homeostasis, it sends positive feedback. So we just increase that. The body sends, or the brain sends oxytocin, which stimulates the uterus to contract and keep going against that pain until the baby has left the body. And so those are the two pathways that we have to bring our bodies back to homeostasis. So I wanna talk about how this applies in our lives. Why is this important? Well, our bodies do this naturally. That's just a God-given divine um, power that we have that we didn't even know about. Uh, maybe you did, but I mean, learning about this for me was incredible, that our <coughs> bodies self-regulate all the time. And the levels that are normal for us are so infinitesimally small that it is miraculous that we are alive and functioning even if there's something going wrong, the fact that everything else is going right is a miracle. And so I've pondered this and thought about the fact that, um, for example, last semester I was dealing with 15 credits. Um, I was in the presidency of young women. I was president of a club at my university, um, as well as working and all of the student social life things, trying to date and all of that. And to be quite honest, like I was out of whack. Emotionally, mentally, physically, I felt so out of whack. And this kind of principle came to mind of homeostasis. Where was I in my balance? And the question then comes to mind, how can we know, how can we find a balance? When do we know to <clears throat> apply a negative pathway loop or positive feedback loop? Um, when do we know to push forward or to regulate. And <clears throat> I really love this quote by Harvey P. Pratt. Um, he talks about the spirit and defines a few of its characteristics. It quickens all the intellectual uh, faculties, it inspires, develops, cultivates, and matures all the fine sense sympathies, it tends to health, vigor, animation, and social feeling. I'm not going to use this anymore because it's way too shaky. Um, <laughs> it um, invigorates all the faculties of the physical and intellectual man. It strengthens and gives tone to the nerves. In short, it is, as it were, marrow to the bone, joy to the heart, light to the eyes, music to the ears, and life to the whole being. So I believe that um, the spirit helps us regulate things in our lives and can help us find which pathway we need to use. So we can use the same systems that our body uses, the same pathway. First, analyze your current state. Where are you at? Are you feeling like life is in balance? Is there something that's out of whack that you wanna change, that you wanna fix? Um, where are you at? How do you feel? Once you've analyzed that, you might realize that there's something that's not where you want it to be, that's not at the level you want it to be. And that's where your command center comes in. This is where we allow the spirit that has all of those magical properties to guide us. We can seek guidance from our divine creator. He created our bodies, he created us, he created our spirits, he knows how to fix us and bring us back to balance. And then once we have that direction, that's when we make a change. Um, what needs to be added or removed from our lives in order to bring us back to balance. So, I just want you to consider in your life um, as you think of the miraculous form of your body and the way it works, how will you find homeostasis in your life? Thank you. Okay, that was lovely.
Thank you, Mario, for teaching us about that. Um, just for those, because a few people came in, welcome, hey, this is video conference. Um, there's food and programs over there, and I guess to explain a little bit how it works, which you just saw, Mariel did the perfect thing. Um, she's just going to teach us about some things. So our next friend that we will hear from is Anna Crabb, who I love dearly. I'll tell you a little bit about her. Anna Crabb grew up in Grantsville, Utah. She graduated from Brigham Young University, where she earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Family Studies with an emphasis on human development. She also received a minor in international development. Her and her husband, Davis, and 18-month-old daughter, Kenna, live in Bountiful, Utah. She's passionate about many things, but if she had to narrow it down, she would pick anything that has to do with child development, parenting, and social innovation. She is particularly interested in providing quality education access for both parents and children to vulnerable populations. All right, I'm super happy to be here. Thanks, Maddie, for asking me to share something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and hopefully it will come across and that you guys can learn something new today. So um, when I was in high school, I, during a couple of summers during my high school years, I saved up money to go on a couple of humanitarian trips. Um, the first trip, I went to Mexico. We built a house. I went to an orphanage and um, did some improvement projects there. The next summer, I went to Costa Rica, where I taught English in a school and did some school improvement projects there. Now, um, these experiences were really eye-opening for me and really amazing. This is when I was first introduced to what poverty looks like, um, and I was, wow, that's my phone, it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, I was kind of introduced to the world of social problems and this flame of, um, yeah, just wanting to, to make the world a better place was kind of lighted within me. And so I, I do not regret these experiences whatsoever. However, to this day, I have no idea if I had any impact at all. And I have no idea if these organizations have any impact. I don't know if they kept track of you know, any measurements to see if the things that they were doing were actually helping. I hope that they were. My gut tells me, especially this one, was not <laughs> doing good things. <laughs> and like, it was, I don't regret it. I'm really glad that I went. It was great for me. But I don't know that it was great for the communities where I was serving. And a big reason for that is I believe that the social problems that you're trying to solve and the communities, societies where they exist are like so interconnected and you can't separate them. And so when we try to do that, we really like, we, we aren't able to progress because we're not relying on the knowledge and the experiences of the societies where the problem exists. And it makes sense, but it happens all the time that we want to fix a problem without actually knowing what the problem is. Here, I don't know if this community was struggling with homelessness and that's why we built the house. I, I doubt that that was the biggest problem going on in this community and maybe what that community needed. Um, so, yeah, what I want to share with you guys today um, is that I don't believe that social problems can be solved by nonprofits or by um, social activists. While we definitely like, need those people so desperately because we need their resources and their knowledge and their research, but social problems cannot be solved until the societies where they exist to become, uh, become involved and we are consulting with them directly. And so I want to kind of take, this is what we think of, right? When I think, for me anyways, for a long time, when I think of social change, social innovation, all these things, I think of these developing countries. But I want to bring us back to our own communities and our own societies, because if we really believe that society is responsible for cha creating social change, then we should start here um, in our own circles. And if you're a part of a nonprofit or you're a social activist that's working in international places, continue to do that. There's people, we need those people for, people for a reason, but not everyone's called to do that. And so what I hope to share with today, with you guys today, is how um, you as individuals and as members of society can create social change. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, when I tell people what I'm passionate about, they sometimes are confused. So a social problem is a condition that disrupts or damages society. And our societies can be global, they can be local, they can just be our families, our friends, at our jobs. We're all part of a society. Um, this is a scholarly definition that kind of defines what a healthy society looks like. So stay with me, it's a little bit wordy, but it's really important to understand. So Hart and Atkins teach that a functioning society requires that citizens feel that their lives are joined in important ways with their counterparts. The absence of such a sentiment reduces civic life to the point that it is expressed as instrumental action intended to fulfill purely selfish interests. 
So you guys may have heard of the term collectivist versus individualistic society. Um, America is an individualistic society. We often, the things, our actions, our lifestyles are often to pursue selfish interests. And this has gotten our country really far. We're very successful because of it. However, because we default and we've been socialized to, to think this way, we kind of forget that our lives are joined in important ways. And so our society isn't always as healthy as it should be. And, and all societies struggle with this problem. And that's why social problems exist, because we forget about this relationship that we have with one another. So I want to share with you um, this. This is called the typology of witnessing. And when I first learned about this, it blew my mind because it really helped me realize like, changing the world is not going on humanitarian trips to Mexico, although it's helpful. <laughs> Really having the most impact looks different, and hopefully this will explain why. So at the top we have, um, so these four boxes kind of represent four different types of people that make up society. We are all, we all fit in these boxes, and across all cultures, everyone in society fits in one of these boxes. Um, so at the top we have aware or unaware of a social problem, um, and then off to the side we have empowered or disempowered and a general rule to know where you fit here. Anytime that you are a member of the majority, whether that's race, socioeconomic status, education status, gender, um, anytime you are in the majority, you are likely going to be in positions of power. Um, and then conversely, anytime you're in the minority, you'll find that you will be in a disempowered position. And so you'll kind of change around depending on what the issue is, right? So let's say I'm aware of LGBTQ issues and I'm in a position of power, I have my circle of influence, I'm able to contribute to, to these issues. So I am in this box that maybe, I don't really know a lot about how to take care of the environment, so I'm gonna be here, there, if that makes sense. Um, so, obviously we wanna be empowered and aware as much as possible. It is only within this box that we can achieve allyship with the disempowered, and this is when we actually start to make dignified and real growth towards social change. Conversely, and this is a really stark contrast, and I want to make this super clear, when we are empowered and unaware, this is when there is potential to do real damage. If we're in positions of power and we don't know about a social problem, it's likely that we are going to be contributing to it in negative ways. Um, so at the bottom here, if you're disempowered and aware, this is when you begin to feel oppressed. You may feel traumatized, you feel without help because you don't have access to the resources or social capital to start making traction on the problems you're experiencing. And finally, um, disempowered and unaware, um, it's everything in the box prior, but worse, they don't know it. And so this, this group is simply surviving, they're not thriving, and we, as social activists, aren't able to tap into their knowledge. These guys know exactly what the social problem is. They know they probably have the answers of how to solve it, but they aren't aware of it. Um, so we each fit somewhere within this typology and we'll change throughout our lives. We may change between empowered and disempowered and unaware and un unaware and aware. We want to strive to push into this top box. So um, I believe that we will be most empowered and most, in most aware um, when we are proximate, meaning when we are close to the problems at hand. So this is going to be in our local communities, um, in our own relationships, in our own lifestyles. And so I think that this message is important for just um, each, every member of society, not, not for the people who want to volunteer in their spare time for you know, some organization. This, is, this message is for every single member of society. So I have four suggestions um, to close to help us know where we can start um, to start making attraction towards social change. Um, the first is to start where you are, like I just said. There's, we all have um, different places where we are empowered and aware, and so start there. Um, the next is to just pick one thing. It's very easy. Trust me, I've studied this. It's, you can get extremely overwhelmed if you feel like you have to tackle every social, social problem at once, so just pick one thing. So for example, recently I realized I'm really doing poorly at taking care of the environment, so I just decided I'm going to start taking better care of my environment. So that's what I've picked recently, and it, I'm obviously a very passionate person, so it changes a lot. But um, So the next step is to give help that really helps. So I bring up the environmentalist thing because I started recycling and I got an extra trash bin and I just started throwing away all the stuff that I've been told my whole life that you can recycle. 
Um, little did I know, a few weeks later, I was like contaminating all this stuff because I was throwing away paper that had like greasy pizza box stains and like food, dried on food, and I was recycling glass, and you're not supposed to recycle glass with the regular recycling and provo. Anyways, so I was actually like making the recycling process less efficient because I just didn't take the time to actually like learn what the best practice is for recycling. So that principle can kind of carry over into any social problem that you're going to solve. Um, so just make sure that you're taking the time to learn what is actually going to help. Um, I just threw a couple of websites up here that can point you in the right direction to know how, how to start. Um, finally, um, we need to learn from our mistakes. Um, this here is called the social um, change cycle. And people, professionals who like solve social problems for a career, they should be following this cycle. Um, so it starts here with a social problem. Based on research, they come up with a theory on how to tackle that problem. They intervene, um, and then hopefully they produce outcomes and they have impact. And then finally, they learn, and then they start over again. And I think this is really beautiful because we can apply this. Because we're, I mean, many of us probably aren't going to solve social problems as our career. But we can apply this principle into our own lives. And um, this learn aspect at the bottom is just super important. Um, I think social problems and altruism, we get really um, wrapped up in them. And we get really passionate and say, oh, I'm doing such a good thing. There's no way I could possibly be doing something wrong by doing this good thing. But sometimes um, within this fear, we have to kind of check our pride at the door and realize, I may be doing some damage, or maybe what I'm doing actually like isn't contributing at all. So just realize that this is all part of the process that we have to learn, and just adjust and keep moving forward. Um, so yeah, to close, um, I do believe that social problems are best solved, can only be solved once everyone in the society gets on board and there's a huge shift in, equilib in equilibrium. Um, and so I just invite each of us to recognize um, the situations in our life where we feel empowered and where we are aware and um, just strive to, to work towards that social change in our own lives. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Um, we're going to go ahead and hear from our next speaker who I don't believe is using presentation, Tori Suggs, and I will tell you about her. She's also my sister, which isn't in the bio. Um, Tori Suggs will be starting her senior year at BYU this fall studying human development in the School of Family Life and minoring in women's studies. She currently works as a summer camp teacher at Adventure Time Daycare and as a team member of Songbird Maternity. She hopes to earn her doula certification after graduation and help women have more positive birth experiences. She loves cake decorating, singing, and sleeping in. Tori Suggs. <laughs> Could you type in some things for, yeah. Um, I just want to pull up two websites as a resource for you guys. So today I'm talking about childbirth. Um, I work at Songbird Maternity. Um, it's part of a birth center here in uh, Provo. And I'm not going to tell you today that you have to eat your placenta or give birth in your bathtub or anything like that. <laughs> um, but I do want to, so my goals for today are to make you aware of the reality of childbirth in the United States and just to get you thinking about it and to have you realize how important it is to take responsibility for your own birth and not just say, okay, you're my doctor, you make all the decisions and do everything for you because that's not um, a great way to live your life. So just type in capital, um, all caps, ACOG. Um, this first reference is the um, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and these are the people that make the rules. They tell you what you should and should not be doing um, and so I wanted to share this with you for your sisters, your wives, your friends, um, yourselves, um, but also I'm going to be um, talking a lot about, I'm going to refer to them a lot with the statistics that I share and the things that we should be doing, so I wanted you to be aware of what ACOG was. And then the second thing is evidence-based birth, and this organization is amazing. Um, the lady that created it has her PhD. And basically all that she's doing is re regurgitating information from um, research that has been done about childbirth to, um, if you want to scroll down, I think it has the purposes. Yeah, there it is. Um, 
So she just reads all of the research and then she creates videos and articles to tell people really what's going on in childbirth. Is this effective? Is this actually helping people? Should you not be doing this? And it's amazing. So I, it's a great website. I will also be referring a lot to um, the things that she has said. Um, and then the other things that I will be referring to, just so you know where all this information I'm going to throw at you is from, um, a little bit from this book, book, I'm going to tell you who Ida May is, maybe some of you know who she is. Um, but also, the reason I couldn't create a PowerPoint slide was because I had no idea what kind of audience I would have. I'm not sure if you know what a doula is or if you don't even know what the three stages of labor are. So raise your hand if you have heard of a doula. Okay, raise your hand if you know the difference between a doula and a midwife. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's start there. Um, a doula is kind of just like a birth coach. They are not your doctor, they're not going to uh, do your stitches or do anything super medical. Um, they are just there to help you. So if you're in a hospital birth, um, something that they can help a lot with is communicating with your doctor because your doctor is going to say, hey, I think you should do this and you haven't done your research, you have no idea what that is and you're thinking, I don't know what the consequences are of that, I don't know if I want that and your doula can tell you all the positives, all the negatives and talk you all the way through it, help you make an informed decision. Um, if you aren't having a hospital birth, they're mostly just there to be another set of hands. If it's a long labor and your husband needs to take a nap or you don't have a husband, they are there to grab you some water, to uh, help you pour water over you in your bathtub to do whatever it is that you need. Um, so doulas are super great. At doula trainings, you learn eight different comfort measures to help the mom deal with what she's going through. Um, and there are really great statistics on how doulas help improve birth. They reduce the rates of tons of bad stuff. Um, and I'm pretty sure it talks about it um, on here somewhere. Um, a midwife is in replacement of an OBGYN. You wouldn't have a midwife and an OBGYN um, in the same room. That wouldn't go well, <laughs> depending on the people. Um, a midwife can serve as a doula for you, but you have to, like, one of them has to be in charge. So a midwife, um, that's a lot harder of a certification. Um, they are the ones delivering your baby. They can give you IVs. They can give you stitches. They are. A medical professional. There are two types of midwives though. There are CNM, certified nurse midwives. They can work in hospitals and they do work in hospitals, um, but they're still under OBGYNs. And then there are lay midwives or CPMs and they um, cannot work in hospitals, but they have their own private practice and they um, can deliver your baby legally in most states. Some southern states maybe not. Um, <laughs> um, so let's talk about Ina May. She was a hippie in the 70s. Her and all of her friends in San Francisco got on some school buses and they rode all around the country and they ended up in Tennessee and they started a community called The Farm. And they have some of the best statistics, um, birth statistics in the entire country. Um, they're still open. People from all around the world go to there to have their kids. They just go like a month ahead, hang out, have their kids, then go back home. Um, and they, they aren't like giving birth in the middle of a river or like doing anything crazy. Maybe that's how it started out, but they know what they're doing. <laughs> and they have like lay midwives, they have the oxygen tanks, all of the medical things. Um, anyways, so Ina May was the one that started that. She took on the role of delivering the babies at first and then she taught more people around her. She has TED Talks, she has tons of books. Um, I would recommend this book the most. Some of her books are a little hippie, um, but this one is the most basic one. The first half is um, talking about just birth stories, um, which are so powerful. And the second half is just her different um, thoughts and opinions on certain parts of birth that she think are important that people should know about. Um, next, I do want to talk about um, a mother's responsibility and sharing birth stories. Um, I love that the, the two presentations that just happened were right before mine because yes, our bodies do know what they're doing and God created them and they are divine. Um, and second, the social problem that we are going to talk about is how childbirth in America isn't doing too hot. Um, so, um, we know that agency is super important. Um, it doesn't really make sense to me how we got to a place where um, the midwife that I work for talks about how people spend more time choosing which, doing more research online for which car seat that they want than which OBGYN they're going to choose that's going to deliver their baby. Um, 
it's um oh i thought forgot to tell you about one more person that i'm gonna quote a lot her name is kristen pascucci and she just um writes about this issue she's uh writes blogs articles books um and she talks about how women just need to raise their expectations birth isn't just something that um that you're just going to endure you just have to get through it like heavenly father didn't isn't requiring 50% of his children to do this horrendous thing. He, they must have had a purpose in it. Um, Melissa, the midwife that I work for, talks about how there's a difference between pain and between suffering. And I think that our society sees childbirth as suffering. It's horrendous. You never hear people talk about positive birth stories. Like, women tend to catastrophize when they get together and it happens at baby showers and it happens at any event. They get together and they talk about all of the terrible things that happen to them and they only tell the horror stories. Um, and then what woman is going to raise her hand and say, oh, well, actually, I had an amazing experience. Like, <laughs> it was super great and everything was perfect and I loved it and it was the best I've ever felt in my entire life. It was so empowering. But some people do have births like that. <laughs> um, but people aren't sharing them. So this is why books like these are amazing because they're just uh, birth stories, positive ones. Women telling their story. And women love to tell their birth story. If you've talked to any woman who's given a baby, they will tell you all about it. Um, whether it was positive or negative, but sharing birth stories is so impactful, but we have just been sharing all the negative ones. Um, so uh, going back to Kristen Pascucci saying that women need to raise their expectations, birth doesn't have to be a terrible thing. Birth should be a part of your life that is going to, like you're bringing a child into the world, this is what Heavenly Father created you to do, and it can be a wonderful thing. Like obviously every birth is magical, even if there's a lot of pain, but there's a, different be a difference between pain and suffering. Um, so taking responsibility for your birth, being educated about what you want and what you don't want, and, um, um, and making those decisions for yourself is super important. Um, so next, I do want to jump into some statistics. How am I on time? Uh, not super great, but do you think? Okay. <laughs> I was gonna, was gonna set a timer, but I forgot. Um, so I just want to throw a few statistics out there to let you guys know what is going on. So um, Kristen Pascucci in one of her pamphlets talks about how um, it takes an average of 17 years for the best practice, what ACOG is telling people to do, to be implemented in hospitals because hospitals are massive and hospitals are businesses and it takes 17 years for them to be doing the right thing. So um, Utah isn't super great right now. Salt Lake is a little better than down here in the valley. Um, but there, um, there are just a lot of things that they are doing that, um, and I'm not a hospital leader. I'm grateful that hospitals exist. Um, they do their job, but OBGYNs, they go to medical school for um, the purpose of learning what to do in every scenario, but um, to become an OBGYN, you don't have to see what a normal, not interrupted birth looks like. That's not a requirement to become an OBGYN, and a lot of them haven't seen it. They have no idea what it looks like when you don't uh, in intervene and get involved. Um, so hospitals are great for intervening when people need help. They save lots of lives, and I'm grateful that they exist, but um, my mother-in-law, she is a lay midwife, and she says that if, um, if you're looking to just have your baby and not have a person um, get all involved and give you medications you don't want and um, do a bunch of things, don't go to a hospital. If you want tacos, you wouldn't go to McDonald's. <laughs> so if you want a natural birth or you want a birth where people aren't involved, don't go to a hospital because OBGYNs are trained to get involved and to, to do more things. So. Um, there are a lot of things that they require at hospitals that um, there is not research supporting what they do. Um, electronic fetal heart rate monitoring. Um, it's those little pink and blue circular things that they put on your stomach and they put the elastic around and it's tracking the baby's heartbeat and it goes off into the little machine and it makes, do you guys know what I'm talking about? And it shows the heartbeat, oh yeah. So there's a difference between best practice and standard practice. Best practice is what ACOG is telling everyone what they should do. Standard practice is what the average OBGYN is doing. And when OBGYNs are taken to court, if someone doesn't like what they did, they are um, kept to the standard of 
standard practice, not of best practice. Um, I don't know why. So um, electronic fetal heart rate monitoring increases a woman's chance of having a C-section, um, even though she doesn't need it, by 65% because it has a 99% false positive rate. Um, so it's telling you that there are problems even when there aren't. Um, so, but the one thing that it does help with is it makes the chance of an infant seizure go down by 0.15%. So it goes from 0.3% um, down to 0.15%. Um, so that means that for every one infant seizure that was prevented, 667 women um, have a 65 higher percent chance of having a C-section when they didn't need one. But infant seizures are significant. I'm not gonna say that th those don't matter. So it's just something to think about. But if an OBGYN goes to court and he decided that I'm not gonna give um, a woman that has zero complications and is perfectly healthy and could have a fine birth, I'm not gonna tell her that she has to have electronic fetal heart rate monitoring. If he wants to do that, he, if he goes to court, he's going to get in trouble. So he's saying to himself, he works in a hospital, it, it's a massive business. Um, he has to give every single patient electronic fetal heart rate monitoring um, or else even if he thinks, even if he knows these statistics and he knows that he's putting this, this mother out way more high risk of having a C-section. Um, other things, I promise I'm almost done. They're gonna tell you that you have to have an IV. The only reason you would need an IV is because they tell you that you can't have food or water. Um, or if you need to go into a C-section, um, an emergency C-section. But um, you shouldn't need an emergency C-section <laughs> most of the time. And um, ACOG does say that women should be able to eat and drink whatever they want. The reason that they tell you that you can't eat or drink is because in the 40s when they first came out with um, this technology, there was a high chance of you choking on whatever you just ate, but that's, that's not a risk anymore. We have great medical practices and in surgery you're not gonna choke on what you just ate. Um, so I don't know why this will do that, maybe because they don't want the women throwing up on them because that's common in labor, but um, just things that the hospital can't keep up on because it's so massive that ACOG is telling, telling them that they shouldn't be doing. Also wearing, wearing the hospital gown. Um, when you go into a hospital room, they're going to they're gonna give you an IV, they're going to put you in their gown. Um, if you have an epidural, then you have to have a catheter. Um, if they want to um, check the baby's heart rate even more than the electronal fetal heart rate monitoring, then they're going to put a screw in the top of the baby's head and it's going to be dangling out the bottom of you. Um, they don't let, a lot of the time they don't let you get out of the bed. Um, because you're hooked up to all these things so you can't get up, ACOG says that, you sh that a woman should be able to be in whatever birth position um, she enjoys the most, um, whatever feels good to her, and to, really use, to use gravity because laying on your back is not the best position to give birth. <laughs> it's just the most convenient for the OBGYN. Um, um, my, the midwife that I work for doesn't even let the women, uh, when she does their prenatals and she checks their belly and all these things during their shots, she doesn't even let them lay on their back for that long because your vena cava goes through the bottom of your back and that's where a lot of blood flow is and a lot of women who are more than seven or eight months pregnant get really dizzy when they lie on their back because that blood, there's so much pressure on, on that part. So anyway, um, and then skin to skin contact. There's something called the golden hour that happens right after the baby's born and it's super important. And this is one thing that the hospitals are getting better at is letting the moms hold their babies right after they're born and have them do skin to skin contact. Um, okay, very last thing. Um, Ina May talks about something called the um, sphincter law. Um, just like your anus has a sphincter, so do women's bodies um, where the baby comes out. And just like when you're in a public restroom and it's kind of hard to go to the bathroom when someone's in the stall next to you because it's kind of uncomfortable, the same thing for a women's body. Um, it's like when you go into the hospital room and they're putting all these things in you and there's a six-year-old white man in front of you and you're just, and you're wearing a, and you're wearing a hospital gown and you're terrified out of your mind because everyone told you it's going to be the hardest thing that you've ever done. Um, it's gonna be hard to deliver a baby. It's gonna be hard to be comfortable. It's gonna be hard for your sphincter to open. And they always talk about, it's the size of a cantaloupe going through the size of a lime or like whatever fruit analogy that you guys heard in, middle, in your middle school health class. And that sounds terrifying, but the female body can do that without tearing, without needing to be cut. Um, even just the difference between an aroused woman and an unaroused woman, there's a huge difference um, in the size of her vagina. 
So being that uncomfortable and like, anyway, you get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, and I've said too many things, but what I want you to do is I want you to be aware of what, oh no, there's one more really important <laughs> statistic. And I learned this in my women's health class and um, in my women's health class, she said that there were only three countries that were um, in this statistic that I'm about to share. But um, so out of all of the countries in the entire world, the only maternal mortality rates that have gone up in the past decade are um, Afghanistan, Greece, um, there are seven of them, and then us. So there's eight total. Um, Afghanistan and Greece are two of them, and then the rest of them are in Central America and, um, and Africa. And we are one of those eight countries where the maternal mortality rate has gone up instead of down in the last decade. And we are the only, all of those countries are not developed countries, we are the only developed country whose maternal mortality rate has gone up instead of down in the last decade. So, in closing, um, I encourage you to, that, so people that are into natural childbirth or that are even doing C-sections by choice, whatever the mom chooses is what's best for her. I'm not saying that everyone needs to have natural childbirth. Whatever the mom is comfortable with is the best way for her to give birth. Um, they, they have birth videographers. That may seem weird to you, but there are tons of videos on the internet of people giving birth. They're not super explicit. Um, you, you can watch them. I just encourage you to change the way that you see childbirth, to share, to read books with positive birth stories, to watch videos of positive birth stories, because it's a beautiful thing. It's a sacred thing. It really is magical. For those of you who have seen it, it is amazing. Um, and to just change the way that you think about it and be more aware and um, go out and spread the word because it's so important. It's how we all got here. So thanks. Thank you so much to Tori for that. Um, she's very passionate about it, as you can tell, and I look for it. Uh, we're going to go to actually, we have a guest speaker via video. I mean, she just recorded her video, but let's see how we can do this here. And she's going to kind of give her own intro. She explains a little bit about who she is and what she does. Um, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. This is going to be kind of tutorial based. It's a shorter video, but she's going to be talking about coding. So if people have computers, you can pull them up and follow along um, because that's kind of what she wanted us to do. So. Hi everybody, my name is Nicole Carlson and I am studying information systems at Brigham Young University and this fall I'll be entering the second year of my master's. I'm excited to talk to you about coding today. It's something that I'm passionate about, um, though I only found it uh, just a couple of years ago when I started taking the prereqs to the information systems program. However, I have always loved math and science. Growing up, um, that was something that I always loved and excelled at and I realized looking back that I had a lot of female teachers and mentors that encouraged me to push myself in math and science and I never felt limited and so I, I feel like that's helped me and guided me to become a woman in STEM, a woman in tech and I am really grateful for that because I found this um, industry that gives me a lot of confidence and a way to push myself as an individual and learn more skills. Though it hasn't always been that way, I still have to fight and learn and push myself every day. If you are interested in learning about technology and getting into coding, you can do it. But it will take time and other people will be better at it because they have more experience than you, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. And that doesn't mean that after you start learning that you should stop. Um, that's something that I have really had to um, fight through um, as I've got into programming is to never give up and just dive in to something that I don't know and trust myself to be able to learn it and I have and I've come a long way. Right now I am interning at American Express as a software developer in New York City. Today I'm going to talk to you guys about just like the the basics of the like coding world and kind of what it all entails and then hopefully I'll have enough time to help you guys get started on building your very first website. So our world is becoming more and more technology based and coding makes it all possible. You have operating systems that run our desktop computers, laptop computers, our mobile phones, um, there's mobile app development, there's website development, video games, robotics, anything electric, um, Alexa, 
voice activated things. Everything is possible because of programming. And programming logic is the core of it all. No matter what programming language you use, it's all about the logic. So for example, you have simple if, then, or else statements. So if a certain condition occurs, then do this. If it doesn't, then do this. So if condition equals true, then do this. Else do this. So this is how computers think. Um, you can te tell a computer how to think. That's what programming is. And so, you know, essentially we do this, we think this way in our lives. You know, if I'm hungry, if hungry equals true, then eat food. If not, else, then eat ice cream because you always have room for ice cream, right? Okay, so that is how programming works in general. What I'm going to talk about today, because this is what I do, is web programming, specifically for websites. And so that's what I'm passionate about. The difference between a web application and just a, a website. A web application is, most of the th websites you go to online today is a web application. Um, if you can, can log in and it, you have an account and it has information about you, that's a web app. You know, that data is stored in a database and it's pulled on to the website for you to interact with it. Um, a website you know, there's just a, sometimes a static website and it doesn't do anything um, other than just like have information on a page. A web application works like this. So you have your computer and you have the browser and you go to the website and it has, you know, your login info, right? And it has your button. So essentially what's happening is you have the front end code that you have the browser requesting front end code that is rendered you have the front end code goes to talks to the back end code which talks to a database so the database um, then sends back the data that is needed for the website. The backend code can um, manipulate it or sort it or verify it and then send it to the front end. And then the front end renders it and displays it so that the browser can understand it. There's different frameworks that do this in different ways, different computer programming languages. For example, you may have heard of Python or C++ or um, Ruby, um, front-end languages. You have the basic HTML and CSS. So with the rest of our time, I'm going to walk you through how to create a web page built with CSS and HTML so that you can view it on a browser on your computer. Now, I hope this video doesn't get you overwhelmed, so don't be afraid to ask for the video to be paused and to catch up because I know that happens to me a lot too. So let's get started. So first what we're going to do is open a text editor. So you can just search, um, this is a Mac, so I'm going to search for text edit and open up this application. Um, if you're on a PC or Windows, um, the text editor by default is called Notepad, so you can search for that. If you might have another text editor on your computer, which is great, if you do, those ones are a little bit helpful to use. So this part is for Macs. Windows might be fine without this step, I'm not sure. Um, but we're just going to click on Format and this um, option that says Make Plain Text, that's going to help us out as we write our code. So we're going to save our file as an HTML file. This is going to tell the computer that this is HTML code and it can be read as a website page. We're just going to call it myfirstwebsite.html and let's just save it to the desktop. Once this comes up, just use use h.html. Okay, so now we're ready to start coding. In HTML, there are tags that 
initiate each object on a page. So we're going to start by creating the head and the body of our web page. We do this by typing the head tag, which is just a less than sign, the word head, and then the greater than sign. Every tag in HTML has an opening and a closing tag. So if we create an opening tag, we have to then create a closing tag, which is just a slash and then the same word. So once we have that, um, I like to create some space to make it a little bit more organized. Then we're going to create a body. Same way. So now we have our head and our body. Um, the head is, includes information on the page that doesn't necessarily show up on the page, um, but everything that you want to show up on your website is included in the body. Um, the head just usually has some extra data. So we're going to include a tag in the head that's called the title. Um, and so then we're going to do the closing tag. And we're going to title this my first website. So this is the title tag and it is going to say that this in here is the title and I'll show you where that shows up on the page later. Um, in the body, this is going to be the text that actually shows up on the page. We are going to do the heading. So you can have a heading tag, which is just an H1 tag. There's different levels of heading tags, you know, H1, H2, H3, to signify um, the different importance of text on a page. So we're going to start with our H1. It's kind of tradition in coding to make the first thing that you create say hello world. So we're going to type that. Um, and then you have to close your heading tag. But we're going to save it, just file save. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open Chrome or any other browser. And we're just going to go to File, Open File. And then we're going to navigate to that page. I saved it on my desktop. And I'm going to click Open. So as you can see, it says Hello World. If you look right here, this is the title. that In that title tag, it says My First Website. So that's what shows up on the actual tab. Um, and so you can see that this page is not actually on the internet. There's not a URL, it's just living on our local computer. Now we're going to learn to style our website. As you can see, it's pretty plain and we can make it look better. So to start, we're going to put a background color onto our web page. So to do that, we just, inside the HTML tag here, you just type the word style equals with quotation mark. And inside the quotation marks, you're going to establish the CSS property which we're going to say background dash color and then I'm going to find the hex code for teal because that's my favorite color and we're going to use this hex code um, you can use any color that you want a hex code is just a numeric version of a color and so I'm going to put that in so now when I save and I refresh it it's going to have this teal background which is pretty fun there's a lot of different types of styles. So I'm going to do um, a text align style, which is basically going to center my text because I want the hello world to be in the center. So let's see what that looks like. There we go. So you can play around with different colors and making it bigger, making the text bigger or smaller, or making the text different colors. There's a lot of different styles um, and, and this styling CSS controls the spacing of everything on the web page. Next we're going to talk about an image tag. The image tag is special as it doesn't have a closing tag. It just has that opening tag. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to give it a source. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to search Google for an image. And I'm going to pick an image and then I'm just going to open image in a new tab and what this will give me is the URL specific to this image so that way you can go directly to it. I'm just going to paste that right in here, right in the quotation marks of the source. So when I save that and I refresh my page, there's my image. Now it's a little bit bigger than I want, so I'm going to create a style. I'm going to say width is 800 pixels let's say and that will make sure that the width only goes to 800 pixels so you can play around with the different 
um, tags and you can create like another tag let's say an h3 um, there we go so you can see that it shows up a little bit smaller because it's less important than the heading tag there it is you know how to create a website and if you want to Google any other HTML tags to figure out how to do anything or CSS styling to get it to look a certain way, you can always do that. It's really fun to just dive in and figure it out and create it the way you want it to create. Like I mentioned, this is just living locally on our computers. So to have it live on the internet, you'd have to buy a domain and then host your file on a web server in order for any computer to have access to your site. I hope that was awesome and fun. There's a lot of resources out online. So if you want to learn more, feel free to reach out for me. If you want to email me or DM me on Instagram or whatever, um, I'd love to talk to you about how you can get involved with learning more about technology and programming because it is a great space to be in. There's a ton of opportunities for jobs and especially flexible jobs and um, it's a really exciting space to be in right now. So let me know if anybody has any questions. <laughs>
and it was a really good side business for us for like her first four years of marriage. Um, we were both in school at the time, my husband was working, so it was really just a side thing. We never really invested 100% of our time in it. Um, it was really exciting for us. We just, like, really proud. All of our friends and family thought it was cool. We had a little Thai business. My dad wears them to church every single Sunday. <laughs> um, so with Zuzu, most of the customers were women still. And for me, I am, like, it's not a very proud thing to say, but I love Instagram. I follow tons of shops. I shop a lot at them, but I don't just follow them to shop. I follow them to see what they're doing. So, like, it's kind of weird. For me, I'm always like, okay, Taylor, did you see what this store posted? Because they did this cool thing, and I think that's a really good idea. So I'm like always thinking like, oh, they, they thought about that, and this is the thing that made their brand stand out because of that. And that's what I'm always thinking about. And it was really hard for me and Zuzu to see other like women bi product businesses thriving more because it was actually tailored towards women, and I'm a woman, and I was doing all the social media, and it was kind of hard for me to connect. So I was getting a little burnt out. Um, last year, around, it was like the same exact time, I was working at the hospital. I worked graveyard shifts seven days in a row, 10 hours. It was the worst and I was kind of getting tired of that and I was like thinking about the things that were going on and like trends that summer and one thing that really stood out to me was the scrunchie trend you know these little guys from the 80s and 90s really crazy and weird but they had these cute little bows on them I worked in the hospital so I put my hair up all the time and they were just another cute thing to like be a little cuter in your scrubs so I started buying some and I wasn't super happy with the other company's product. They were either, the bows were too big or too floppy, they weren't tight enough so they didn't actually hold your hair up, um, didn't have enough color selection. So I, at 2 a.m. in the morning at my other job, I started searching for manufacturers and trying to find someone that would work with me. A couple hard things with finding the manufacturers is that you have to reach minimums, you have to like, so that means you have to order a certain amount of something and I wanted lots of colors and I wanted different types and so I had to find someone that was willing to work with small quantities, which at the beginning is important because money and demand. Um, so I actually got a couple samples from other people and I knew exactly what I wanted because I knew what I didn't like from the other stores. So I got my samples and one lady like stood out above everything. I manufacture in China and she was amazing. She helped me with everything, accepted my small quantities, helped me with my fabrics, was like, I love her so much. Um, I still use her today. And from there, it was started. I started out with, well, first of all, I started my business at my other job, mostly between the times of 2 and 4 a.m. So it's actually kind of nice because that's when China's awake. So they're like, <laughs> they're like, what are you doing? Like, why are you up? And I'm like, oh, I'm just at my other job. Don't worry, I'm fine. <laughs> um, so we started out with seven scrunchy colors. Um, we also have earrings that we have, we included, and then like scarves, neck scarves or hair scarves like this. And so we needed a website. My husband was kind of working for a job in this time, so he actually was the one that kind of spearheaded the business in the beginning. But he made a website on the platform Shopify. If you're ever looking to start anything like this, Shopify is a great um, help for small businesses and it's really user friendly. Um, so he created the website, we were ready to go, what are they at? So then you're like, okay, well, how did you do it? So how I did it was through Instagram. It worked super well for my brand. Um, there's a funny thing with Instagram. It used to be like chronological order. So everything that everyone that you followed posted, you'd see it in the feed. But now they changed it so that it's engagement based. So you will only see posts on your Instagram of things that you're engaging with and liking and commenting and watching their stories and stuff. So it was really important to me seeing from my other brand and Andy how I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be an active brand where people felt happy. I wanted it to be bright and colorful and I wanted people to be able to engage and connect with it. So we started out at the very beginning growing our Instagram feed by working with micro influencers. And I'm sure you've heard of the influencer trend on Instagram and it's just working with other people who will share your brand to help grow your reach. 
And so we worked with like small people just like in high school and college that have kind of a reach and we grew our brands like really fast doing that at the beginning. And that was really, really cool because we'd never seen that with Zuzu. Um, so around, around October, things started to really pick up. Um, I was selling out all the time and it was getting, like, it's a really good problem to have, but not in my mind. I was like, I can't, I can't be sold out. Like, I need more stuff. So I was like, just, okay, duh, Adrian, we need to get more. So around the beginning of November, I ordered, like, my biggest order. I had tons of stuff coming in. It was, like, 6,000 scrunchies and scarves and all that other stuff. And um, I was getting about 15 sales a day, which doesn't really sound that much now, but, like, I was making more money every week than I was every two weeks at my job. So I was just, it was getting so hard because I was working so much and, and every time that I was awake, I was working. And so I just took the plunge in November and I just quit. And it was really, really hard for me. My husband did get a job, so it was like a little bit more st stability, but I, I like to make sure I'm like sure. I don't know how I'm an entrepreneur because I don't like the risk, but. <laughs> um, we took the plunge and I started working full time and I quit the day before Black Friday, which I wouldn't recommend doing um, if you're gonna do a sale. So I did a huge sale on that Thursday, like we started Thursday night, whatever. And between the Thursday and Saturday, I got 365 orders and I almost died. We, <laughs> we didn't have, I don't know how that happened, but like I just couldn't believe that 365 people ordered on my website and like, how do they even know? And well, yeah, anyway, so we had all those orders and it was me and my husband. I made my sister come and my cousins come and we shipped for like four days straight on their vacation. They got a lot of scrunchies in return. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. Um, it was kind of a roller coaster through that holiday season. It was super busy and I needed to hire someone. So I just reached out on my Instagram and I was like, does anyone want to come work for me? And I got a girl that was in my ward to come work for me and she helped out over the holiday season and that was like my first employee. So now I'm kind of going like December till now. I've got about 70 different types of scrunchies. I have lots of different types of products. I have scars and clips and we're always changing what we're doing. Um, since then we've moved locations. We've built like, it's just in my basement of my house. We have like a huge warehouse thing set up. I have two like basically full-time employees and it's kind of crazy. We get about 50 orders a day and we're able to do like fun themed launches and it's been really, really cool to see and to grow that way. Um, I'm probably running out of time. I was supposed to start a timer, but I forgot. But I just want to give you a couple tools. If you are thinking about doing something like this, tools that have helped me to grow. Um, one is Instagram, I already said that. It's helping you to cater your community and get people that will support you and motivate you. Um, I think sometimes I see other people's pages and I see all these hate comments from all of the people and people are just really rude on social media. But um, on mine, everyone has been super supportive and like I get messages all the time of people saying like how much they love my brand and how much they love, how responsive and happy and whatever it is. And that's like super fulfilling to me that I'm actually someone that they want to follow. Um, another thing I didn't talk about but it's huge is like the photography. On your Instagram you have to make sure that everything is really clean and neat and follows your brand and I've had a photographer that's been with me from the beginning and it's really helped cater like my aesthetic and what people want to see. Um, another thing that's really helped is ads and I'm sure you guys have seen those on Instagram and Facebook. We've started doing those and we've introduced videos into them and so it's a lot it's better for people to interact with because they see your product in a video, they're like, oh, I could be that person, like that's me. So anyways, my husband runs on the ads and they've helped a lot and I believe that it's because of our age demographic, they like the Instagram world and our videos and our product. Um, employees have been a huge tool to me because I was doing everything on my own and it was like driving me insane. They, yeah, so it was really hard to be able to say, okay, this is my baby, you can do this, like, let's go. And they've been like so, help, so helpful and I really love them. And another tool is a good manufacturer. It's hard to find, but I just really got lucky with mine and she's helped me with everything. Like, I have these, I'll show you now. 
These are my first scrunchies I started with. Um, when I was shipping them, I didn't know what to put them on, and I messaged her, and I was like, hey, I need something to hold them. And she's like, okay, let's talk about a scrunchie card. And she designed this whole card for me. Super, just like, yeah, anyway, so she's the best. Helps me with lots of my resources, things like that. Um, and then another good thing for us has been our markets and the events that we do. And we do like a lot of like the pop-ups around Provo, around Christmas and springtime. And it's another way to help you get your mar your product out there. I would get people that message me all the time saying, oh, I saw, I got your product at this market and I need more. Like, are you gonna be in another market? So it's super helpful for people to buy stuff in person. Um, and closing. And it's kind of funny reviewing all these highlights in my business because I haven't always felt like so happy about it because it's actually very hard. <laughs> and some days I would just break down with anxiety and like the feelings of weight on my shoulders of, it was me running it. My husband was always there and he's always helpful, but it's like the, that weight of like, oh, this is all me. I can't mess this up. Like I need to keep succeeding. I want to make sure I'm getting ahead of the next trend. and doing the best things I can for my business. Um, but after reviewing this and taking a step back, I, I feel really proud of what I've accomplished. And I was able to buy my first house with my income from this business and um, create a community of people that support me and that I can help them feel pretty in their scrunchies and their Andy products. Um, so yeah, oh, I was gonna say one more thing. They're probably wondering where the name Andy came from. My name is Adrian, but as a kid, my whole family called me Andy. They always, I don't know why, but um, I wanted my brand to be something personal to me, and I wanted it to be a collection of all my favorite things, and so Andy was the best connection that I could find to making it my name in short, and anyways, so that's it. <laughs> Yes, we love Andy, and we're very proud. Um, we actually, my sister worked for her for a long time before. Oh, yeah. She um, <laughs> had full-time employees, and we've all been over and helped, and it's been really fun to watch her do that. Um, so we're going to go on a break for about like five to seven minutes. We'll come back and be starting just before 10.30 to get ready for our next set. Thank you to the amazing girls. Let's clap again for those <laughs> The next portion is also a video, our next section. She couldn't be here. Her name is Marilee Franzen, who we know and love. Um, I'm gonna give a short bio about her. She, we worked for her, is what I'm saying. And she's a lot older than most of the people who are here, but this is what she does. Marilee Franzen was born and raised in Mexico City, Mexico. She served a mission in Washington, D.C. and studied international relations at Brigham University. Following her undergraduate studies, she completed a master's of public administration did I make that up, or is that true? Not true. Okay. As well as a law degree from BYU. Um, she has a husband named Russell, four very cute kids. She loves nature, she loves God, and she currently runs her own private dual immersion elementary school from her home called Lighthouse Montessori. So this is what she does. <laughs> Hello, Maddie and friends at the Mini Girls Conference. This is Marilee Franzen. And as I was thinking, what could I share in 10 minutes that would be of significance? I thought about the, my legal background, my administrative background, mothering tips, and all kinds of developmental stuff. But something stands out as the most important insight I could give you. And that is the role of the name of God in our salvation, the name that has been appointed for our salvation. So just to make it interesting, I'm going to give you three seconds to think what that name is. You got it? What do you think of? As you know, God has a lot of names. The Almighty, the Creator, Jehovah, Jesus, the Beginning, the Lamb. But there is one name in Scripture that has been pointed out from the beginning of time as the name for our salvation. Now, why is this important? I believe that name is the iron rod. If you are like me, you may have friends or even family members who once could see and feel with clarity the love of God and 
the reality of the plan of salvation and they trusted that the church was led by God and that prophets were real. But now there's a mist of darkness around the earth and they cannot see what they once saw. They cannot perceive what they once did. And they are standing in a different place right now. What is that iron rod? I wonder, right? Like it's the word of God, but what word of God? Okay, so let me tell you a little bit of how this started, okay? This study actually began before all this commotion took place. For the year 2011, so eight years ago, I decided that I would study the scriptures with a goal in mind to prepare myself for the last days. And I picked up a new, brand new copy of the Book of Mormon, a red pencil, and I started studying away. I branded the date, that's why I remember. And I thought I was gonna be highlighting everything about wars and the signs of the times and the moon getting red and all kinds of things like that. But when I actually studied it carefully, I didn't find any of those things to be really uh, helpful. I wasn't using my pen, my red pen very much as I read through the Book of Mormon, but I got to Isaiah. I really, I think it's chapter 16. I'd have to go back and look, but in there, Nephi is quoting Isaiah when he says, Ye that have been born out of the waters of Judah, or the waters of baptism, who swear in the name of God, but don't do it in righteousness. Anyway, he goes on to say, basically, to those of us who have taken the name of God, that there will be turmoil in the last days, and there will be battles, and God will save us, not because we deserve it, but because of his name that we have taken upon us and he will protect us because of taking his name. So the light bulb went on, wow, this name, his name is the secret weapon. It's a key to our success in the last days. And as I read um, Jacob and about the power of the word of God and how things were created, by the power of the Word of God. My study became a study of the Word of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And basically, I ask you, what name did you come up with? Well, this is the name I came up with as the key words, the words of God that bring us salvation. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, I imagine you're not surprised, right? Why? Because this name is everywhere. It's like water to fish, right? We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We take the sacrament to take upon us the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, so that the Spirit may be with you. We're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I baptize you. We go to the temple, and if you think through the ordinances that take place there, you'll notice that everything we do of importance in the church has these, either one of these, the, one of these, Jesus Christ or the Son of God. Even when he comes to the Americas, he says, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I created the earth in uh, chapter 9 of 3 Nephi. And... Basically, these words are the, be a big deal. I used to believe, I assumed that the name Jesus came when he was born, and it was. But these actual words were revealed before he was born. We know that Moses knew them. Adam was told by God that he and his children would be saved if they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Abraham and Moses, the, uh, to me, the Pearl of Great Price is very valuable because I've learned this there. And um, also the plan of salvation. Okay, so now let's delve a little bit into those words, okay? Why would those words be so significant? And I mean, I could go on telling you about stories and how people loved it. If you haven't noticed, look for Nephi's chiasm in the name where he... The first time Nephi says Jesus, do you know what it is? Think for a minute. 
it is not in first nephi and it's not in the beginning of second nephi it's actually when he's ready to close when he tells us okay guys i'm gonna tell it to you plainly so that you may not err and you will not be able to be mistaken so it's second nephi chapter 25 or 26 and what does he tell us he actually makes a chiasm which is a type of hebrew poetry the hebrew scholar the hebrew people would actually notice the cadence of the sentence, just like we italicize or put something in bold so you won't miss it, they would make a chiasm. And what that is, is basically a poem in this sequence. So I say idea A, B, C, C would be the main point, and then it repeats back B, A, so that this is here. And you know what Nephi says? He's never said Jesus before. And he says, and his name shall be Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the beginning. And just as surely as Moses, and I'm just paraphrasing, you have to go actually read it, but opened the waters and made all these miracles and took this serpent, the brass serpent is the middle point. Then God will do miracles for you if you will believe in him. In his name, you shall be saved. So basically he's saying, his name is the brass serpent. His name is a symbol that you can take hold of, you can think of, you can hold it with your head, you can take hold of it with your body when you partake on ordinances. Every ordinance in the gospel has a physical element to it. And when we partake, when we take um, part of these ordinances or commitment or, or declaration to God is that we are taking this name upon us the name of Jesus Christ, the Son, upon us. And I think that's significant. We can take a hold of it with our minds, with our bodies, with our hearts. We can think of him, we can have faith in him. Think of your favorite hymn, what is it? Is it one where you actually sing to Christ? Like, I need thee every hour, or um, does it have his name? I believe in Christ, or... I mean, I don't know what yours is, but my favorite hymns have his name, or I'm talking to him in person specifically, and so I can take a hold of it with my heart. Um, now, I think this is very important in our day because our faith is being attacked in this um, world of reason where we're so so focused in the mind, in what's legal, what's logical, what's, uh, you know, the evidence, very head-oriented. We need to have something to hold on in our heads with our faith, in our heads, not just our feelings or our hearts. Those are being attacked. I've had people tell me, oh yeah, yeah, you can keep on believing on Christ because of this warm, fuzzy feeling, which is just an emotion and it's just uh, flickery. And I mean, I felt the same way when I've gone to concerts, right? They like minimize it because it's a feeling. Well, I'm here to tell you that feelings are part of human beings. And even those people who are offended or are leaving, they are doing it motivated by a feeling. I've noticed that their feeling is often, uh, they're feeling uh, betrayed or that they were lied to or that something was hidden. Now, what's my point? Feelings are real and they do affect who we are. So we might as well embrace them and acknowledge them as a source of sometimes of guidance but also sometimes of uh, like mis being misled. So, okay, let's go back to the cognitive part of things. Um, so I think the following idea can help us. I, it has helped me hold on cognitively to my faith, okay? So, I mean, it, this name is all over the place and the emphasis that prophets give to the value and the power of it it's everywhere. I don't know why we don't recognize it as we should. I mean, President Nelson does. That's why he's asked us to call the Church of Jesus Christ that, and not just the church or the saints, right? Like excluding these specific words, Jesus and Christ or the Son of God. So we should use them. Okay, I need to close up here. I could talk to you for a couple of hours, but I won't. I've already 
fast my time, but he really fast. So Jesus makes reference to the fall because that's the name he got when he was born as a mortal man, just like I was named Merrily and everyone who sees me calls me that. That was his name as a man. So it helps us think of a very specific man in a very specific time period that was belonged to a certain community and a certain father and mother. Was He was real. He walked, he talked, he ate, just like we do. He's not some energy or some disembodied force. He's Jesus. He's that man, right? Christ points to the atonement. All the ordinances of the Old Testament were symbols of uh, that atonement or that sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, and that's why they were expecting this Christ. Son of God, the scriptures tell us, is the reference to, it's actually the original name of the priesthood, the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. But we don't call it that out of respect. We don't want to say this name or any of these really, but that is specifically is being protected when we call it Melchizedek priesthood. And that points to the creation, the power of God to fix, to mend, to create, to destroy, to have control beyond our power. And what are these things? Actually, the word the son points to the family. And Elder Christopherson, a couple years ago in conference, when he was talking about the pillars of the plan, and well, that's what this is, if you recognize them, the fall, the atonement, the creation, he said that there's one more, the family. And I think, I was thinking, well, how come we never had that one before? And why is he pointing it out? Well, I think we actually did. It's just our culture has shifted so much that now we actually have to point it out. But the creation was made so that we could have families. The fall happened so that there could be children and spouses could be kept together and there could be a family, right? Adam fell so that man might be because Eve partook of the fruit. And the atonement is also so that we can um, be back to our Heavenly Father. So there is a family right there. So the fall, the atonement, the creation, and the family. So when we have those names, the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we also have doctrine. We also understand who He is, what His mission is to save us, to help us, and what His ability to do that is, the Son of God. Now you'll remember Lamoni was a descendant of Lam Laman and Lemuel. They, their parents had this knowledge, but when Laman and Lemuel left the ordinances and the revelation that came through the prophets, a few generations later, King Lamoni did not know what the nature of God was. He didn't think it was a man. He thought it was a great spirit. He didn't know what his goal was to be a Christ, to help. He just didn't know. And he didn't know anything about God or the Son or anything like that, right? So what does Ammon do? He starts by teaching about the creation. Then he tells, teaches him about basically the, the atonement and the fall and a relationship to him. He passes out for a few days. He wakes up and what's the first thing that he says? He actually praises Christ through his name. He says, uh, blessed be the name of my Redeemer, I have seen his salvation, and he, somewhere in there, says these words. So these words are something very significant. As we understand that, I believe our prayers can be empowered. As we align our minds, our hearts, and our actions to that name that we partake, that we took upon us on covenant, when we covenanted, and as we pray in that name, as we align our minds, our faiths, our devotion, then we can capture that, we can invite the power of God to actually help us and fix things and guide us through this mortal life. Uh, I believe it's a name that is very special, that we should study, that we should cherish, that we should teach to our children and that we just need to simply recognize. I think that once you start looking in scriptures for this, you'll find lots of things. And uh, I say this I, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Mary. She also wishes she could be here, but she um, is translating at some international conference today because <laughs> that's what she does. So we're going to go on with our next pr uh, presenter, Maddie Dunn.
and I will tell you a little bit about her. Um, Madison Dunn is from Eugene, Oregon. She grew up going to a Spanish immersion bilingual school as well as an international high school. She loves playing soccer, lacrosse, volleyball, painting, drawing, and creating. She served her mission in Ecuador, lived in Israel for a time, and spent last summer in New York. She's studying public relations here at BYU and minoring in international development. She helps manage a local concert series called Juice Jam and loves spending her time getting to know people and learning from their lives and perspectives. Here's Maddie. talking about globalization and social media. Um, first, I want to talk about perspective and how important that is um, in globalization and social media. Our perspective shapes everything, obviously, the way we interpret the world around us and the way we interact with everyone. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my own upbe up upbringing. Um, I, as she said, I went to a bilingual school growing up and learning Spanish, and I was really involved in the Latino community. And so um, I, like in my perspective of the world, when I'm with my Latino friends, I feel like I'm one of them. I don't feel like an outsider. And I feel like my identity is um, really confusing to me. And not just because of that, but I just feel really passionate about different religions and cultures. And I feel really involved in a lot of different communities. And so I feel like I'm a part of everyone. And that might be offensive to some people, but it's confusing for me because I don't, um, fully understand how to interpret that and um, anyway so that is part of my perspective um, when I love getting to know about different people and um, what makes them the way they are um, I like to learn about their upbringing their views of others how others view me um, and I um, think that it's really interesting because the more we learn about people the more we have that human connection um, the more we can expand the way we view our world and change our own perspective on life itself. Um, so speaking on connection, we need it to survive. As much as we say that we're dead inside, we don't need anyone, we do. <laughs> um, the benefits of it are pretty, pretty crazy. Um, it leads to, the benefits of social connection lead to a 50% increased chance of a long life, um, it strengthens our immune system even, um, and that was interesting too because it says that the research done by Steve Cole shows that um, genes impacted by loneliness also code for immune function inflammation, and so that's how it affects our immune system. Um, we have lower levels of anxiety and depression, that's kind of a given. Uh, higher self-esteem, greater empathy for others because we have more opportunities to interact with people and um, go through things together and learn that way and we're more trusting and cooperative. Um, lack of social connection, pretty much the opposite of everything I just said, um, with an emphasis especially now, um, with an increased risk of suicide, um, especially as I'm gonna talk about social media, that has increased an incredible amount. Um, uh, other things that I thought were interesting was we have a decreased ability to learn and we have a worse memory when we uh, disconnect ourselves from other people. So human interaction is extremely important. And there's been a lot of studies on that. Um, there's one study um, on Romanian orphanages, how when um, these children were left alone and they didn't have enough um, contact with humans and they didn't get to experience that kind of nurturing and love, um, that they didn't grow and they, their bodies weren't able to be nourished that way. So it's extremely important. Um, some stats. In 1985, Americans claimed that they had three close friends, but in 2004, 25% of people said that they had zero close friends and they couldn't trust anyone. Um, after surveying 20,000 Americans, 43% feel that their relationships are not meaningful. And Gen Z, those who were born after 1995, reported um, that they were the loneliest generation um, in, compar in comparison to the other people who were analyzed. 
Um, suicide rates have increased 24% from 1999 to 2014. Um, they've greatly increased following the year 2010 when Instagram came out, following lots of other um, social media platforms. Um, in the last seven years, youth suicide rate in Utah has skyrocketed 141%. And suicide is a leading cause of death in Utah for kids 10 to 17 years old. And um, I referenced him at the bottom, Colin Karchner. He's this man here in Utah and he's doing amazing things, trying to help. Um, he, he, he's a public speaker and he goes around and encourages kids to get flip phones or be off the phones completely and not have social media, especially deleting Snapchat and Instagram because um, a lot of people, a lot of children have been led to pornography because of that and child sex trafficking as well because of those platforms. And um, as we just talked about, suicide. And um, so he's been working a lot with the, within the Utah community, but also expanding to the whole U.S. on how on helping parents um, be more understanding of their children and be able to have that more social connection with their children and monitor their social media usage because it is like affecting the youth so, so badly with suicide. Um, how connection used to be. I was thinking about this the other day. <laughs> we used to have like, you know, film cameras, but even when digital cameras came out, we'd have like, we'd take one picture and be done. We didn't take a million pictures and then they're all like the same picture with a few different movements and then you have to decide from like 80 pictures which one you like the best and it's overwhelming, you know? It's like, just choose one picture. And we were happy with it, like look how candid and cute that is. Anyway, so then <laughs> um, family and friends, um, when we didn't have social media, we had phone calls and we could make connections that way, but also I feel like there was more of a point to meet in person. And we met with our families and our friends more. We would call our friend up and then, okay, I'm speaking like I lived in this generation and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, our parents, <laughs> they um, would call each other up and then they'd meet up and actually hang out in person, you know? And uh, family reunions were a bigger deal because that's when you actually physically get to be with your family. Um, for me, living in Oregon, my family is really far away. And, well, not as far away as some other people's, but it's far away from me. And um, I don't get to be able to go home on the weekends and see my family, you know? And a lot of people are in that same situation. And so I feel the same way where, um, like, when I'm with my family, I drop all my plans. If they're in town, I'm going to be with them the whole time because it means so much to me. And I feel like social media has definitely changed that aspect of valuing that time together as a family. Because if, even when we are together as a family, we're on our phones. Um, and then the other day, I went to Rock Canyon, and I was just feeling really overwhelmed with social media. And um, as, OK, to give you a little bit of background, my sister is a YouTuber, and a lot of her followers will follow me. And so um, I've been able to interact with a lot of people internationally. And I love learning about their lives. and. Um, Sometimes I just get really overwhelmed because there's a lot of people to talk to and I feel like I have to respond to everyone for some reason. And so anyway, I went to Rock Canyon and I was just sitting there watching the water for I don't even know how long and realized like I just got in this daze and I was just in my mind and I was just thinking about how, and I made a point to not bring my phone when I did this. And I was thinking about how growing up in high school when I didn't have a smartphone, I would cherish moments so much more. Like I would see a sunset and my first thought wasn't, oh, I need to take a picture of this or put this on my Instagram story. It was, wow, that's beautiful. Are you looking at this? <laughs> you know, and um, every moment just mattered so much more because I only had that moment in that moment. And I was only with those people during that time. And I only got to see that beauty and those interactions and everything around me in that moment. And so everything meant so much more and I didn't, have to, I, I wasn't concerned about documenting everything and making sure that I had pictures of everything. Um, and I feel like people were a lot happier um, without social media. I was talking with my parents about this and my mom said that they never had FOMO. Like FOMO is such a recent term too, within the past 10 years, everyone has FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. And um, I was talking with my mom about it and how like college life was for her and she said that she, they didn't have social media to see what other people were doing and then be sad that they weren't invited or jealous of whatever. Like if they heard that a party happened and they weren't there, they'd be sad for a moment and then, and then that was it. Like she didn't dwell on it, she didn't have to see all the pictures and everything. 
and they talked more in person, they meet up in person more. People were more polite, they didn't have to, they didn't hide behind screens and troll people all day or like say their most hateful, deepest feelings <laughs> and attack people. Um, there wasn't like cancel culture where someone says one wrong thing on social media and all the brands drop them. Um, no one was seeking digital validation um, or clout. They're not trying to become an Instagram model. They're not trying to become this famous YouTuber. Um, and people spent less time alone. Um, definitely people still spend time alone, but instead of feeling lonely and turning to a phone to look, to scroll through things or to call someone, people could make the effort to go and talk to people in person and seek that help in person. Um, Okay, um, I'm just going to rush through this because there's a lot that goes into the evolution of social media. But um, basically when Facebook first came out and MySpace came out, it was a way to connect with your college peers and your friends and stay connected and just kind of, it was kind of a creative space. Um, like on MySpace you could have your favorite song when people would go to your page that they'd hear and it was just kind of a cool way to show your life but it was just to keep updated on people's lives. Um, as social media has changed, um, the more we got smartphones, the more we could make more friends on a national level. It wasn't just like our own community and then got and went to international. People were collaborating more. Um, I put scams on there because scams were more frequent on uh, social media rather than just emails. Um, people just were making connections all over the world and learning from each other. Um, and that's where globalization comes in because it's become such a global thing. Social media is creating this platform where we're pretty much all just one culture and we're all just one people interacting with each other. Um, every, we're sharing languages, music, fashion, tradition, art, dance, we're sharing so many different things and incorporating it into our lifestyles. Um, I, according to Spotify's Culture Next report, which is a report that they just released um, on the generations right now and how they're interacting with media, I just thought there were a couple really interesting facts. Uh, that 42 percent of Gen Z's and Millennials identify more as a global citizen than as a citizen of their own country and I definitely relate with that and I feel like a lot of us can because we do feel like since we're exposed to so much um, so many different um, cultures through the internet that we do feel more of a global citizen. Uh, 59 percent of Gen Z's and Millennials told us that they turn to music to help them cope when they're sad which is interesting that they're turning to music instead of an actual person and talking. 64% believe online aesthetics have altered what the generation expects to see in the real world, and 51% believe that there's too much visual simula simulation and think audio offers a nice escape. And I think that's so crazy that like we see the world as so aesthetically pleasing online, and so we expect to see that more offline. And like going on a hike, I, I yeah, anyway, I'm not gonna get into that. So 66% told that they expect brands to be part of a de the debate to promote more progressive values and to play a more meaningful role in society. And that's interesting too that they just expect all these brands now to be more involved because that's a big thing with Gen Z's and Millennials as we um, expect everyone to be involved on every social issue and take a stance and to be proactive within our communities and not just our local communities but global communities. So I basically um, just explained this but um, it's interesting too because we're, we like we think it's really important to preserve certain cultures, but at the same time, our cultures are all becoming meshed as one. Um, so yeah, um, sharing the content, ideas, photos, videos, personal experiences. Um, we're mixing music genres, dance styles, slang, fashion. We're all combining our different cultures through social media. Um, and I wanted to pose the question, is it acculturation if you've grown up feeling connected to or surrounded by a different culture from your own and you identify with that? Um, a lot of people get offended nowadays because of that. Um, and as I said, we're all becoming kind of one culture. Some people would say that um, we're losing our cultures throughout the world because our, our worlds are combining so much. And some say that we're becoming more united because we're coming this one great big multicultural world culture. Um, and I think it's really interesting that, that there's so much talk about um, what our identities are and like how we identify ourselves and all these labels nowadays um, because we are exposed to so many different ideologies and um, cultures that it is kind of confusing sometimes because we like to identify with 
certain aspects of different cultures, but it might not necessarily be um, what people expect from us. So in closing, how do we balance social media and real life interaction? Has connecting with others internationally become more important than connecting with our friends and family who are closest to us within our own communities? Is social media benefiting our own lives? Do we feel genuine connection? Or are we left feeling empty? Does social media impede us from learning social skills? Is social anxiety and depression more prominent because of it? Um, social media has a lot of great things, um, but at what cost are we using it? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Maddie is a great example um, in a lot of ways of using social media for positive um, experiences and also being a really good missionary. So uh, look her up on Instagram, she's cool. But, um, <laughs> So the next person that we're gonna hear from is Lisa, Lisa Scott, who we love. Lisa is a PhD student studying counseling psychology at BYU. I'm actually reading the wrong bio, hold on. Oh no, this is right, okay. Her graduate, her graduate research focuses on systematic oppression and its impact on individual behavior and mental health. For her dissertation, she's studying whether therapists hold racial bias, and if so, how it impacts client treatment and outcomes. In addition to research, she teaches the course Women's Issues and Career Exploration, and works as a therapist in the University Counseling Center. She is also passionate about community activism, and because of this, she recently produced a video advocating for better inclusion of LDS members who identify as LGBT. She was also recently employed by the BYU Library to analyze data on experiences of sexism within their workplace. She feels that every community deals with issues of oppression and marginalization, and that the only way to begin to ameliorate these patterns is to begin to discuss them. After graduation, she hopes to become a professor of psychology so that she can continue to research, teach, and practice therapy. Lisa Scott. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk today on um, women in career planning. Um, yeah, there's a million things that I wanted to talk about, but this is what I know the most about, so I decided to do that. Um, and I wanted to tell you why I'm passionate about it. Um, so uh, my, so I attended BYU and. In my junior year, I was kind of hitting this moment of like, I'm studying elementary education, but I'm not really passionate about it. And I had this moment of like, why am I studying elementary education? Like I've never been passionate about working with kids. And so I started analyzing like, why? And wh what, what else can I do? And I, for the first time ever, considered graduate school. And when I considered the option of graduate school, I realized I wanted to be a therapist. And it was just like a really like, light bulb moment for me and I just felt like I was asleep before then and wasn't really active in my decision of what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I'm really, really happy that I had this moment because I'm super passionate about what I do. I love, um, I love school, I love teaching, research, therapy, everything that I get to do is just such a joy in my life and gives me so much meaning. And so I'm passionate about other women having these, like opening their minds and um, really being active in their decision-making in their life because it's impacted my life so much. Um, so, some statistics about Utah. This is another reason I'm passionate. I grew up in Utah. Um, when I was 12, we moved here from California. And so Utah culture has impacted my thinking a lot. Um, and so these stats kind of like hit home for me. I'm like, I totally know where this comes from. So Utah has the lar largest gender wage gap in the nation. Women make 70 cents for every $1 men make. Um, national organizations consistently rank Utah at or near the bottom in evaluations of women's educational att attainment and economic equality relative to other states. Utah is ranked um, last out of 50 states for percentage of the STEM workforce made up by women. Um, so this is um, a percentage of people that receive graduate degrees. And so the yellow is Utah men, the baby is Utah women, and then the green and blue um, are U.S. men and U.S. women. So in the U.S. it's it's even, and that's like within the last, I, I don't know, but like that's a new achievement that women and men are neck and neck with getting graduate degrees. But in Utah, 
we're struggling. To, um, and that doesn't mean everybody needs a graduate degree. That's not at all what I'm saying. But it's just when we understand these different trends, we can start to analyze what's going on in our culture that creates these different trends. Um, so this is percent of female enrollment by undergraduate field of study in 2016. So um, Utah versus US women in these fields. So physical science, Utah zagging behind, mathematics, engineering, education, were above average business below, and biological and life sciences were like almost half of the natural average. So that's just fascinating to me. And what is it that we're, about our culture that women aren't considering science as an option, as something that they could be talented in and do well in? So, um, okay, so I wanted to show you so yeah, so the question is why? Why do we have different um, cultures across states have different statistics and different outcomes for women? Um, so there's a, um, a career theory by, uh, I don't know her first name, Linda Godfordson. Um, and I'm just gonna have us watch this video because I don't wanna explain it. Um, and, it kind of walks through how women from childhood through adulthood um, begin conceptualizing what careers are viable options for them. In 1981, Linda Godfordson created the theory of circumscription, compromise, and self-creation. This theory focuses on the developmental experiences and socialization of an individual. Her theory of circumscription is a process of eliminating career choices and is divided into four stages. The first stage is orientation to size and power. It applies to children between the ages of three to five years old. In this stage, children become aware that adults have roles that are bigger and more powerful than them. Stage one, children are taught to assign value judgments. For example, they classify things as strong or weak, or an adult is big and the child is small. The second stage is orientation to sex roles. It applies to children between the ages of six to eight years old. During this stage, sex role norms and attitudes in children surface. They begin to classify things based on gender appropriateness. Children learn what their genetically commissioned self-image is supposed to be, based on whether or not they are a boy or a girl. The third stage is orientation to social evaluation. It relates to children between the ages of 9 to 13 years old. During this stage, children begin to label occupations according to their social status as well as their sex type. In other words, during this stage, when it comes to choosing an occupation, we more so focus on income, status, and efforts, the abstract view of what these jobs are to us. The final stage is orientation to the internal, unique self, and it applies to children that are 14 years of age and up. In this stage, children use complex concepts to eliminate occupational options that do not fit with their self-identity. In other words, during this final stage, one will replace idealistic aspirations with more realistic aspirations. These are based on what is accessible to who they believe their true selves to be. Next is Godfrey's theory of compromise. This occurs when a person begins to sacrifice roles that they see as more compatible to themselves for those roles that are more easily accessible to them. Okay, so um, when I teach my career class, um, I tell my students that I, my goal isn't to get everybody to be CEOs, because that's just not what every woman wants. Um, but my goal is to help, so what we're looking at, this is the zone of like all of the careers based on um, your gen gender socialization and also um, effort boundaries are what is blocking off careers that are too much effort or you know not enough effort. Um, and then this is the toler tolerable 
boundary for gender. Um, and so basically what I say in my career class is we're, we're trying to understand how this gets formed and what and how it can shift for you. And so um, it, I, I just want people to understand this boundary. And then what I feel is that when we understand that boundary and how it was formed in childhood and adulthood and just through socialization, the more that we're gonna be free agents. Um, and some women are gonna choose uh, to stay home with their children and that's gonna be, you know, that's that, what they wanna do and some women are gonna choose to work. But I don't feel that we're truly acting with our agency unless we can understand this boundary and how it impacts us. Um, sorry, one second. Okay. So um, I worked on a research project um, called Women's Future Fantasies. And um, so what we did is um, my, uh, the professor that was one of the professors working on the project with me taught a women's issues and career exploration class. It was the first uh, of the kind and I've, like, taken over, I've taken over a section of it, but she started it. And, um, she taught four semesters of it, and uh, for all four of the semesters, she um, invited her class to participate in this study. And what they did was they wrote um, an, an essay of a fantasy day in their life 15 years into the future. Um, and they wrote from waking up to going to sleep what they were doing, and then we analyzed them. We got 118 essays, so 118 participants, which is a massive <laughs> amount for a qualitative study. Um, most of the participants were 18 to 20 years old, so they were looking at like 35 years old. Um, and then we analyzed like what did they envision for their future. Um, what we found was about a fourth of the participants wanted to be stay-at-home parents. Almost everyone else, I thought this was fascinating, almost everyone else envisioned themselves as part-time um, part career, part-time parenting. So uh, working, a lot of times they described a job that they were off by the time their kids were off. Um, a school and they were able to be there um, when their kids were home. Um, cooking and childcare were the most common activities mentioned. Um, and what was really fascinating about that is that it was almost always by themselves doing those um, jobs, even when their spouse and children were home. Um, and what's, what's fascinating about that is that research shows that even when both spouses work full time, women are still doing more housework and childcare than men. And so, um, it's all about expectations and we're seeing that in our data of women, um, even as they're like consciously thinking about like what does like the dream day look like 15 years in the future, they're expecting themselves to be in charge of all of the household responsibilities even when they envision themselves working. So I thought that was really fascinating. Um, students mostly envision themselves in traditionally female do dominated careers which matches you know the st statistics in Utah and not that all of these students are from Utah but um, you know, demographically, there's some, obviously, some overlap in Utah and BYU students. Um, and many describe careers that would allow them to be available when their kids were home from school. All but one of them imagined themselves married. Um, and something to keep in mind with this data is that these are women that took a women's issues and career exploration class. So these are probably more career focused than your average BYU student. So I would guess that more students um, than a fourth on campus, female students want to be stay-at-home parents. Um, so the question with this is um, awesome goals, and is that going to be the reality for a lot of these women? Um, so these are percentages, um, age range, and then percentage of Utah women in the workforce, and then this is U.S. women. Um, so as you can say, see, the majority of women will be working their whole lives. Um, you know, up to retirement age, more than half of women are in the workforce. And then you have the average hours of female work and then average hours of male work. Um, and I just feel that um, if, if this is the reality, if the percentage, and even like outside of Utah, it's even higher, it's like 75% throughout the lifetime will be working. Um, I just am passionate about women preparing themselves to do something that they love if they have that opportunity. And, um, and you know, this is a, like, this, like, presentation is very, like, targeted at a privileged uh, demographic. Like, there's a lot of people that don't really have these options, but um, because we're in this privileged place of being able to get an education, 
we have a lot of options and I'm just passionate about, you know, you really might have to work even if that's not your ideal situation and why not pursue something that's gonna be awesome for you um, if that's the case. And then also um, all but one, so 117 of our participants out of 118 envisioned themselves married, but only 60%, 66% of even Mormons are married. And so that's 34% of adult Mormons that aren't married. And you know, what are you doing with your life? Um, are you doing something you're passionate about uh, with that time? Um, so what's the solution? Like I said, like it's a lot about culture, um, but I think something that's cool is that, um, as we all know, something that really impacts Utah culture and um, Mormon women thinking is um, the church. And so um, I have a collection of quotes from different leaders that I think are just super awesome about this topic. Um, so Joseph F. Smith in 1895, so ahead of his time, um, Mormons were actually like really feminist in, around this time. Like they were like in the suffragette mo movement and like a lot of the public Mormon publications were like pushing like non-traditional ge gender roles. Really cool. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read it really fast. Shall a man be paid higher wages than is paid to a woman for doing no better than she does the very same work? Shall the avenues for employment be multiplied to men and diminished to women by the mere dictum of selfishness of men? But what process of reasoning can it be shown that a woman standing at the head of a family with all the responsibility resting upon her to provide for them should be deprived of the avenues and ways or means that a man in like circumstances may enjoy to provide for them? Yet many of these unwholesome conditions do exist and that too vastly to the detriment of women. Str strange to say, women may be found who seem to glory in their enthralled condition and caress and fondle the very chains and manacles which fester and enslave them. <laughs> Let those who love their helpless, dependent condition, oh my gosh, and prefer to remain in it, enjoy it, but for conscience and for mercy's sake, let them not stand in the way of their sisters who would be by the right and ought to be free. Um, let them who will not enter into the door of equal rights and impartial suffrage step aside and leave the passage clear for those who desire to ent enter. Many women are afraid of women's suffrage because monopolizing men have tried to frighten them from seeking their right. Let no one, woman be deterred for a moment from her whole duty by such a con contemptible twaddle. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Russell Boward. One sister may be inspired to continue her education and, and attend medical school, allowing her to have significant impact on her patients and to advance medical research. For another sister, inspiration may lead her to forego a scholarship to a prestigious institution and st instead begin a family much earlier than has become common in this generation, allowing her to make a significant and internal impact on her children now. Is it possible for two similarly faithful women to receive such different responses to the same basic questions? Absolutely. What's right for, right for one woman may not be right for another. That's why it's so important that we should not question each other's choices or in the inspiration behind them. Um, and that's something that, with the data, I'm just so interested that, like, I think we had, we had a handful, sorry, I don't know the exact number, but a handful out of 118 planning to have full-time careers. And I just, don't really buy that only a handful out of 118 would enjoy full-time careers. Um, and so for me, again, like it comes back to agency, like what cultural factors keep women from considering that as a valid option in our lives? Um, and like uh, Elder Ballard is saying, like we have valid options in both areas. So Sister Ruth Renland was an attorney and I love hearing her story because it's kind of outside what we typically think for an LDS woman's path. Um, when Dale was a resident, he had a demanding call schedule on call every third night. You don't just marry a person, you marry a lifestyle. So I basically was a single mother and when I embraced it, it became easier. At the same time, he also was called as a bishop of an inner city ward, so he wasn't at work. He was, when he wasn't at work, he was doing church business. I treated school as a nine to five job. So she was in school while he was like MIA and they had a kid. Um, <laughs> I arranged for all of Ashley's childcare, preschool and after school arrangements. I'd go to school, come home, spend time with Ashley and then study at night. During finals, Dale would take her with him on home visits while I studied. I actually worked out quite, it actually worked out quite well because no one could refuse letting them into their home with such a cute four year old. <laughs> Okay, and then Gordon B. Hinckley, oh, I love him, but um, the whole gamut, this is the last one, sorry, thanks for bearing with me. The whole gamut of human endeavor is now open to women. There is not anything that you cannot do if you will set your mind to it. 
You can include in the dream of a woman you would like to be a picture of one quali qualified to serve society and make a significant contrib contribution to the world of which she will be a part. I was in the hospital the other day for a few hours. I became acquainted with my very cheerful and expert m nurse. She is the kind of woman of whom you girls could dream. When she was young, she decided she wished to be a nurse. She received the necessary education to qualify for the highest rank in the field. She worked at her vacation and became expert at it. She decided she wanted to serve a mission and did so. She married, she has three children. She works now as little or as much as she wishes. There is such a demand for people with her skills that she can do almost anything she pleases, which is a cool plug for like grad school and like getting up, up there in your career because then you're like your own boss and you can set your own schedule. Um, she serves in the church, she has a good marriage, she has a good life, she's the kind of woman, did I already say this? No. That you might dream as you look to the future. For you, my dear friends, the sky is the limit. You, you can be excellent in every way. You can be first class. There is no need for you to be a scrub. Respect yourself. Do not feel sorry for yourself. Do not dwell on unkind things others may say about you. Particularly, pay no attention to what some boy may say to demean you. He is no better than you. In fact, he has already belittled himself by his actions. Polish and refine whatever talents the Lord has given you. That's all. Um, if you want any references, I can get them to you. I was just too lazy to put them in the presentation. But. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, and exactly how you came. So we're going to go and have a presentation by Athena Kafalis. Athena Kafalis was born and raised in St. George, Utah. She graduated from Dixie State University with an Associate of Art in 2011. From 2012 to 2013, she served as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Russia St. Petersburg Mission. Upon completing her mission, she began attending BYU. After changing her major from Deaf Studies to International Relations to Speech Pathology to Ancient Near Eastern Studies to Nursing, she finally found her true passion in life and graduated with her Bachelor of Art in Linguistics last April. <laughs> in addition to linguistics, she's deeply passionate about ice skating, reading, flowers, Sudoku puzzles, and telling jokes with friends for which we are very grateful. I think it helps. <laughs> My notes, so I'm just using my phone if I need it. And this is bright. Yeah. <laughs> As if I'm not already nervous. Okay. So, language, right? Let's see. <laughs> okay. Um, Worfianism. So, Worf is a linguist as well as a type of engineer. It was like a fire prevention engineer, which was very specific and funny to me. Um, he lived from like 1890s to 1940s or something. Um, but during his uh, linguistic phase of life, he coined an idea that is this, that there are certain patterns in language that shape a speaker's view of the world, but the world is also shaped by various languages that are spoken. So I'm kind of going to focus around this and explain it through examples that I've seen in my life, as well as what I've been taught. Um, so the Hopi tribe concept of time, oh, that wasn't supposed to show up yet. Um, is this idea of non-linear time concept. Um, it's kind of hard for us as English speakers to wrap our mind around because we have a very linear view of time. So when we think of time, we think of there being a past, present, and future. Our language shapes that idea. Um, even in uh, the way we reference it, uh, we move forward when we're talking about the future. We kind of like lean back with our body, like our uh, what is it called, pragmatics, I guess, uh, leans back with the past. Um, and this is really present in sign language. Um, when you're speaking in sign language, everything that is going to happen, you literally move your hands forward. Everything that has already happened has moves back. Um, and this is relevant as well with languages that do the opposite. So some languages have the future behind you, and some of them have the past in front of you but it's still a linear time frame. With the Hopi language um, from the Hopi tribe, Native American tribe, uh, they view time in a circle. And so anything that happened 
today, what time is it, 11.30, um, could have already happened in the future, like tomorrow at 11.30 or yesterday at 11.30. It's just like this continual circle of time. Um, if you don't get it, it's fine. It's not that important to get, <laughs> but it's just an interesting concept. Um, and it's also um, made evident in the movie Arrival, if you've seen it or not. If not, spoiler alert, they, <laughs> the aliens communicate in these circles, which is representing um, the Worfian concept of nonlinear um, time. And they communicate through memories that haven't happened yet. Um, but they're happening in the moment, but they haven't happened. And so it kind of just like, it's, it's really weird. Just watch the movie, it, it does a better job of explaining it. But um, yeah, so I just kind of grasp the, we just need to grasp the idea that, um, you know, our, our view of language and the way we speak can shape the way we view the world, which is what the actress learns in that movie. Um, so I'm gonna share examples of what I've learned with this open-mindedness about our abstract thinking of nonlinear time or language is a better way of saying it. So to hike. When I think of to hike, I view this image in my head kind of of something like incredibly impossible, something not super fun, but it has like a pleasant outcome because you've accomplished something and it has like a nice view usually, um, but it's difficult and sweaty and <laughs> dirty and <laughs> not the funnest thing, right? Then I learned about um, a phrase in Russian that can explain to hike, um, and it's <laughs> Joel. Where's Joel? Do you want to pronounce this for us? <laughs> yeah, which means to walk according to the mountains. And so the different languages here just makes it so much more beautiful. And when I think of to walk according to the mountains, I'm like, hello, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and like that's just like a whole new idea and the idea of hiking just becomes so much more pleasant in my mind and I'm like yeah let's go for a hike guys what's sweat what's dirt I don't know um, another example is the word carnation so I worked as a florist for like three and a half years before my mission and carnations are like the ugliest flower to me I, I'm sorry if that offends anyone if they're your favorite I'm sorry it'll get better in a second um, but they're kind of just like the cheap flower that you can put into any arrangement and it like fills space. Um, and so my idea of a carnation was gross. <laughs> like disgusting, <laughs> nasty flower. And then um, I was the TA for floral design at BYU. And we learn about like the genus names of them in the Latin and Greek roots of them. And the word for, dianth or for carnation is dianthus, which this is gonna shake a lot because I'm nervous. Okay, so di um, means like, is referring to deity, and it's a Greek term for it. And anthus is literally the word for flower. And the history behind this word is that carnations were put together in like arrangements and given to the gods when they would like parade through town or whatever, back in like Greek mythological times. And so that changes my idea of nasty carnations to like, flowers falling from heaven because it's like the gods, right? And it just creates a so much more beautiful image in my mind. Um, moving on, um, I was not expecting this to be here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, let me, oh no. Oh. That's because I updated it this morning, awkward. Oh. Um, it's actually really important. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so we to you last night. <laughs> Let's just see here. What are you? Surprise oh, right there. Power yeah. language. Okay. Oh no, don't look. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, we'll skip. Guys, this is because I procrastinated. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, so our view of language shaping our thoughts about the world, right? It's shaped like stereotypical inanimate objects for me so far. This is shifting that view to animate objects. So sociolinguistic stereotypes, starting off with the movie The Lion King, um, we see Mufasa, is that his name? I couldn't remember this morning. I was like, what is his name? I, I called him Jafar, and I'm like, I'm not sure that's from the <laughs> So there's Mufasa and Scar.
Scar, who are brothers, right? And Mufasa has a standard American English accent or dialect, um, but Scar has like more of a British dialect, but like they're brothers, right? So <laughs> our view of them is that people with British accents are the evil one or the enemy in the movie, whereas in American English is like the hero or the good guy. Um, and this translates to the, oh no, okay, <laughs> the hyenas as well, who are the sidekicks to the bad guy who have a Hispanic dialect when they speak English. Um, and as well with, hang on, so, gosh, okay. Um, so this is telling us that our sociolinguistic idea, our language idea, is telling us that British people are bad, Hispanic peoples like assist the bad guys, but standard American English is awesome. Like, and they're always gonna be the good guys. And if you think about, um, this like extends beyond the Lion King even. If you think about what a Russian character plays, what role a Russian character plays in any movie, then like if you think about it, it's gonna be a bad guy always. Like there's never a good Russian guy, right? And that's what this movie is. I'm pretty sure it's Rocky. Yeah. Um, Rocky IV? I don't know, <laughs> I've never seen it. But I know that the guy is Russian, he's like the bad dude or something. Um, and then there's one movie that I could think of that like tries to break this stereotype, which is Despicable Me, who he's like, the he's technically Russian, or supposed to be, and uh, you know, he's a bad guy, he tries to be a good guy, spoiler, oh, spoiler alert again, um, but he's kind of bad at being good, if that makes sense because it's just not his normal role. Um, and so it really is interesting how our language and understanding how we speak and what we speak about has shaped our ideas of society um, and things in our mind. So language really is a power. Um, and just a few things that I wanted to talk about were um, linear thinking, changing preconceived thoughts about yourself, um, because if we have all these notions about society and how we view animate and inanimate objects, how are we thinking about ourselves or using, what language are we using with ourself? Um, and to just change as you learn more about yourself, change the language that you use with yourself. And believe the nice things people say about you and change your internal language um, so that it goes from like the ugly carnation to like flowers from the gods, like your mind has the power to change that language. So that's it. Thank you. Loved it, it was very interesting. Um, we have one more presenter in this section before we take another break, who is the one and only Emily Clark. Okay. Emily Kwok was raised in Orem, Utah, and made the mighty move to Provo to study industrial design at Brigham Young University. She is one of four girls and embraces her heritage of being a daughter of Chinese immigrants and a first-generation college student. She enjoys everything from hiking in the canyon to reading books on the front lawn of her student apartment. If you were to ever ask Emily about one thing she dislikes, it would be the fact that she got eczema on her right hand, first knuckle, the year she was applying to her program because of stress and overexposure to weird toxic chemicals in automotive spray paint. <laughs> so ask her and she will show you about that. <laughs> she, she enjoys working with her hands, loves campy movies? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm great. Campy. <laughs> And will cry every time she buys a potted plant because it reminds her of the circle of life, God, and everything beautiful about the world. I just use the word camp because that's like the theme of the Met this year, the Met exhibit, and they use the word camp. So I love that exhibit. Oh, I need a, that thing. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, today I'm going to be talking about design and empathy. And like Maddie said, I'm studying industrial design. And so usually um, when I tell people that I'm an industrial designer, they usually react in one of two ways. And it's the first one being like, oh, okay. And they look kind of confused because they've never heard that term before. Or they're like super excited and they're super confident. They're like, so you design factories. <laughs> and that's not exactly true. Um, <laughs> industrial designers are, um, we, we study the, we're in the field of product design and development. So it's funny because I'll graduate with a BFA, but we're in the School of Technology and Engineering. So it's a, it's a mesh between the world of design and the world of engineering and manufacturing. So with that being said, 
you can think of an industrial designer as um, an inventor in a way. We look at issues, we generate ideas and solutions to those issues, and then we test and prototype, and then we keep doing that until we generate a final product. So, um, with that being said, I do understand that designers do get um, a bit of a bad rap sometimes. When I say the word designer, I usually think of like handbags or shoes. I think of someone who wears all black and they have straight across bangs and for some reason they're really good at like being able to smoke with like really large oversized glasses as shown here by our friend Carl Waterfield. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I get it, like I know a lot of people like this in my field. But to be honest, um, behind all the smoke and mirrors and the pizzazz and like the overpriced t-shirts, um, the hallmark of a good industrial designer is their ability to empathize. Um, in fact, it's so important that the Stanford, sorry, the Stanford, Stanford University has come out with something called design thinking. Um, and they have a course about it. And this is kind of what that is. I know some of you guys might be familiar with this. Um, and looking at this graphic right here, you might think that design, the design process or design thinking is something that's really linear. But I'm here to tell you that it's not as linear as you think it is. Um, and I'll explain to you why. So, um, so last semester, um, my professor gave us an assignment to create a product based off of the word progress. Um, he told us to interview at least 10 to 15 individuals. And within a few days, my classmates had um, about 170 different opinions, descriptions um, on what progress was, um, how it's created, and how it can be recorded. So as you can tell, we had a lot of information. We took a few days to put this information together, condense it, and analyze it. Um, and we, in, or in an effort to make this information a little bit easier to digest, we put them into um, two by two squares um, based on like similarities that we saw between different definitions and stuff. So um, after studying and analyzing all of these charts, we were told to then focus on a single quadrant and then ideate based off of that quadrant. So I chose this one right here, the green one, um, community crisis. <laughs> um, and as an, an individual who cares about climate change and sustainability, I wanted to create a product that made a difference in the way we treat food waste. Um, but I really struggled with understanding or even knowing what that product could be. So I took a few days, about 72 hours in exact, to brainstorm um, what that product could be. And just to plug, um, these are not my best pitches, but anyway. <laughs> Also, um, the dis like usually our projects in school um, take a long time to complete. This project was our final, and we only had about three weeks to do everything from interviewing to final render completion of product. So this was um, a super crazy fast-paced um, process, and to say that I took three days to do preliminary ideation um, says a lot about the ideation phase. So um, anyway. So I brainstormed and I went from everything from like packaging. How can we use packaging to eliminate food waste? How could we use um, shopping carts? How could we use, um, how could we help people meal prep better so that they're not wasting food in the end? Blah, 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 blah. So, but despite all of this brainstorming, I didn't feel really good with any, oops. Oh. That was the first slide, sorry, skip this one. I didn't feel good about anything that I was thinking of. I just felt like these were all really out there, they're really kitschy, like, um, the, like the bane of every industrial designer is to have your product end up being on an infomercial at like 2 a.m. at night, you know, you just don't want that. So I, and I took, this, I took this assignment very seriously. I really wanted to do something good. So yeah, I just wasn't having a good time with any of my ideas, and so I, I thought it would be good to start um, Instead of being in my head the whole time, I needed to take time away and start looking at what people did. So I turned to the people around me. I began to observe the habits of my friend and family. I started to notice the little details um, of their food preparation from purchase to um, disposal. I would ask people when they go, went 
went to go grocery shopping to take a picture of what they bought. And, um, and yeah, so basically what I was looking for was what were the gaps? Um, why would they end up throwing away so much food? And living in student housing, I observed firsthand that college students are re we're really bad at this. Some, we tend to throw away close to 30 to 40 percent of the food we buy just because we're not eating it. And why is that? Um, is it because we buy too much food? Is it because, you know, we're, we think we're going to be living healthy and then we're like, oh, let's actually go out to eat, you know? So I was trying to figure all of this out in my head. And so what I would do is I would go to people's houses. And in Provo, the standard college apartment houses about four to six people and a standard kitchen in that apartment has about one to two for refrigerators and then a small pantry. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. <laughs> um, and it's funny because when I would no visit my friends' houses, I noticed their fridges were usually configured in a really similar way where one roommate gets one shelf, right? So you have usually three people sharing it and you just choose one and that's your shelf for the rest of the semester. Um, not only that, you have like the fridge door that's just full of like weird condiments that you never use that was left behind by like the guy that lived there before and you just, you're like, this looks nice and like kind of high end so I guess I'll keep it. But like, I don't know how to use it so like we'll just leave it there. And then like, it, and like in your freezer is like insane because the freezer is small but you use it like because everyone wants to freeze, freeze their food and like keep it. Um, and if you're sharing with three people, it's like, how do we divide this into three? There's like no good way to do this. Anyway, so there was an issue, right? Um, sorry, I'm like kind of way jumping ahead. There's an issue with how fridges were configured and how us as college students were using it. You get this problem of if I'm on the bottom row, that's where the crisper is. That's where your vegetables are supposed to go. All my vegetables freeze before I can eat it, and I have to throw it away. If you're on the top shelf, you have the opposite problem. You're your vegetables start going bad and you're like I bought this two days ago what the heck so I have to throw this away now and it's like no one really wants that you don't want to waste money and also it's bad for the environment um, so um, this was an issue and after two to three days of observing all of this I was like how can I as a designer ultimately ha help college students use their freezer space or their fridge space a little bit better and so I won't go into the rest of the detail of my project. Um, if you're really that interested, you can come to my house. I have like a whole portfolio on it if you really want to, but it's just like a freeze fridge. So <laughs> who cares? <laughs> um, but the reason why I'm talking about this is I really want to hit home the, the idea that empathy is crucial to the design process. And I want to emphasize that it's empathy and not just keen observation because when Without a strong desire to improve upon what you're noticing, you're really not going to create a product that is going to have an impact. You're just gonna end up in an infomercial somewhere. Um, so as I've become more engrossed in the design world, I've, become, I've begun to pay attention to the little details around me. Um, like walking to class, if I were to stub my toe on a ledge entering the building, um, I think about people in wheelchairs who have to deal with that before they get into the building. And I began to think, how must that be for them? And in what ways can we improve um, doorways so that they can easier, like they have easier access to the building? Um, another thing to think about is like doorknobs. <laughs> um, how can the shape and size of a doorknob handle indicate how, whether or not a door is a push or pull and why is that beneficial? In case of an emer uh, uh, in case of an emergency, um, and someone needs to get out of a building quickly, um, how can a doorknob help them leave that building faster and um, easier? Um, in class, we've often talked about um, the example of life vests. Um, there, um, bef a, a while ago, their life vests had a very counterintuitive design. A lot of first responders would notice people during shipwreck situations that they'd be holding their life vests instead of actually like putting them on. And so a lot after a lot of intense like user testing and prototyping, they realized that they had to make the switch from something like this where you have just random cords everywhere and it's not super um, intuitive of how to put it on to something ooh, more like this um, that um, is more illustrative of a, of a shirt and only really has one way to open and close it. And that way you're saving people's lives through design. 
Um, so I hope by sharing these examples with you guys, um, you've been able to see that good design really does rely on a heavy understanding of human nature. Um, just because one person might use something a certain way doesn't mean that um, another person will. Um, our, jobs, uh, our job as a designer is to understand people and to understand those commonalities between people and turn that into something that will benefit everyone. Um, like I mentioned before in that graphic um, from Stanford University, we can use um, um, we can use this process and and prototype and test, but we, it's important that we always go back to the empathizing point, the very first point. And as we do this, we can be, be we can all be better designers and be more considerate of everyone else. break and then we have one video and three more speakers after that so go do your thing food bathroom and let's actually do a five minute break this time so we'll start just before 12 which is more than five minutes <laughs> just come back <laughs> so um let's start this next video, this person I love with my whole heart, and she couldn't be here, she lives in California. Um, also, she has some family members here, so shout out. Uh, Brenly Pereira is her name. So, Brenly Pereira is from Modesto, California. She grew up, this is cute, anyway. She wrote this in first person, so it just kind of sounds funny to translate it to third. Anyway, Brenly Pereira is from Modesto, California. She grew up with an angel family of two parents and two siblings. She's always loved to learn new things and always wanted to do something good, but struggled to know how. She attended UC Berkeley for her undergrad, majoring in environmental justice, and discovered a lot about problems in the world that need solutions. It was really hard to pick a topic for this conference. She served in the France Leo mission with Mario halfway through college and is now a student at UC Hastings in San Francisco. It's a law school. She loves her husband, dogs, sunshine, and dairy products. She dreams of having many kids and advocating for the rights of those spurred by the justice system. This is friendly. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Brenly. I'm from California. I wish I could be there with you today. I'm hoping that I'll be able to see videos of everyone's presentations. This is my fifth try recording this without going over way too much. So I'm gonna try to go quick and I'll just dive right in. Um, I wanna talk today about something called prison abolition, which is uh, something that's really important to me. Um, basically, it means building a world without prisons. And I wanted to start off with some disclaimers, which are that, um, my connection to prison abolition has been mostly either intellectual or like super biased. Uh, biased because I've worked with a, a lot of people who are currently incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, so I mostly see things from one perspective. I understand that like maybe some of you in the room have been affected by crime in way more serious ways than I have. If you have, I'd love to hear your comments and I'm super sorry if any of this comes off as insensitive. Um, but yeah, so prison abolition. Um, I want to talk about this today, not because I plan on convincing any of you that it's the right thing or that it's feasible or anything, but just because if it does come up on, on your ballots in like 10 or 20 years, I hope that you won't just write it off as insane and that you'll give some thought to it. Um, so there are so many things I could say, and as I was thinking about this, I feel like the main reason that a lot of people don't like the idea of abolition is that um, there's like this uh, like belief or yeah there's this belief in society that prisons help to reduce crime so i wanted to talk a little bit about that and how i don't think that's true um, in my criminal law course last semester we talked about um, justifications for punishment uh, and I'll go over just a couple of them, but a lot of them you could probably come up with. If I were there, I would ask you and you'd probably come up with them. Like deterrence, for example, incapacitation, rehabilitation, things that sound really good in theory. Um, but as we talked, we talked about critiques on these reasons and why they might not hold up. For example, you may think, oh, we have, pr we have prisons and we have punishment because if people know that they could be put away for doing something, then maybe they won't do it, right? Um, but I think that is not true. First of all, it assumes that everybody is thinking rationally when they're committing a crime, which isn't always the case. Um, sometimes if somebody's in the heat of the moment, they're not thinking. 
or sometimes the consequences of not committing the crime are more, they're scarier for them than, than the potential consequences of getting caught. For example, somebody who um, is in like dire straits financially and has no, doesn't see any other options, doesn't see um, a community that can help them through it, they might think that uh, they're better off, you know, robbing a bank or something. Or, for example, a woman who um, is in an abusive relationship and has been for a long time and sees no other way out of her life rather than to, um, to act violently, somebody like that isn't thinking, oh, I might get caught and I might spend my life in prison. They're just thinking in the moment, like, I cannot be in this situation anymore. So I think that gets to like a, like a basic part of prison abolition, which is acknowledging that um, crime is not... It's not made up solely of individual acts, but it's made up of um, of like driving forces in society that kind of they they put certain people in certain positions that it's hard for them to not um, act in an unlawful way. And to highlight this point, I wanted to read you some lyrics from one of my favorite Jack Johnson songs. Um, you may have heard it. It's called uh, Cookie Jar. Um, if I were there, I'd play it for you, but I'm just going to read part of it. Well, it wasn't me, says the boy with the gun. Sure, I pulled the trigger, but it needed to be done. Because life's been killing me ever since it begun. You can't blame me because I'm too young. You can't blame me. Sure, the killer was my son, but I didn't teach him to pull the trigger of the gun. It's the killing on his TV screen. You can't blame me. It's those images he's seen. Well, you can't blame me, says the media man. I wasn't the one who came up with the plan. But I just point my camera at what people at the, what the people want to see. Now it's a two-way mirror, and you can't blame me. You can't blame me, says the singer of the song and the maker of the movie which he based his life on. It's only entertainment, as anyone can see. It's smoke machines and makeup. Man, you can't fool me. Now the most important part. It was you, it was me, it was every man. We've all got the blood on our hands. We only receive what we demand. If we want hell, then hell's what we'll have. So that like, that song focused specifically on the effects of entertainment um, and how that affects crime and stuff like that. But I think there are a lot more things that drive people to commit crime, specifically um, not feeling like they have a community to rely on or not having financial resources or, you know, emotional and mental health problems. There are so many other things that we all take a part in, in creating, even inadvertently. You know, we don't mean to make people suffer, um, but sometimes just the systems that we are a part of create suffering. So, sorry, that was a really long way to go over deterrence, why... The threat of punishment doesn't always stop people from committing crimes. Next, I'd like to talk about incapacitation. So a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, if you put somebody away, then they can't, can't commit crimes. We're keeping our communities safer that way. It's kind of true, but like not really. First of all, there are still a lot of crimes you can commit from inside prison walls. Um, for example, if you're involved in, in gang violence, you can still interact with those people from inside um, and even like tons of other types of crimes you can continue to commit from inside. Additionally, which I think this is even um, worse, um, people can't be permanently incapacitated, incapacitated from committing crimes if they're put in prison. Um, for example, if somebody is, uh, is put away for like five years, then they come out and because our prison system is the way that it is and they're often treated with disrespect, they're often treated um, violently by other prisoners and by guards. Um, they come out angry, right? And they're not less likely to commit crimes in that, um, in that circumstance. So if we're putting people in, making them even angrier, and then letting them out, is that really incapacitating them from um, creating harm for our society? Uh, there's also rehabilitation. That's uh, one of the major reasons that prisons were invented in the first place, actually. It was seen as a way to uh, provide people with a chance to work on themselves. And for some people, that does actually work. I was just talking to, um, to a woman today who uh, she served in prison for 25 years and just got out in December. She's doing amazing now. 
Um, and we asked her, do you think you needed that time in prison? And she says, I think I needed all 25 years, but it definitely could have happened outside of prison. And I think it would have been way better if, if I'd been taught the things I was taught in prison when I was a kid. And if I had been taught how to self-reflect and how to have self-esteem and how to, you know, be considerate of others, I could have been taught that a long time ago and without any prison involvement. Um, also, the rehabilitation argument, I feel like that really, once again, kind of makes it seem like the only thing that causes crime is individual decisions and like personal defects. Yeah, there are lots of people who have personal defects out there, but it's not usually caused by them. It's usually the circumstances around them. So that's what abolition is all about. It's about creating um, a society where we kind of address those, those problems that do cause people to be in circumstances where, um, where they feel driven to commit crimes. Um, also, and a really important part of prison abolition is something called restorative justice, which is, uh, it's like a practice where, I don't like the terms victims and offenders because it just seems, eh, it, anyway, but I'll use those words, where victims and offenders can come together um, in a setting where they can discuss like what happened and how, um, how it affected their lives, what happened. Um, and I think that's like really good because take, for example, the person who went to prison for five years and came out so much angrier and more willing to commit crimes. If perhaps they'd had that chance to interact with the person that they've harmed and really like be held accountable and also see, you know, just like really, it just, it humanizes it. And I think it, um, it helps people to, to understand the impact and for everybody to have healing. So some of you might be thinking like, okay, sure, that's fine. Like prisons suck. Great. We should fix them. Why don't we just focus on prison reform instead of prison abolition? Um, the thing with prison reform, although I would totally love for prisons to be better, they have like the worst medical care. They have really bad treatment. They do have volunteers that come, but not enough. I would love for prisons to be reformed, but the thing that is the issue there is the more money that you pump into prisons, the less money that um, is being put towards schools and public housing and other community resources that can help prevent crimes to begin with. Okay, so I unfortunately can't ask you for questions, but I'm guessing that one question you might have is, what do we do about more serious criminals? Like, for example, serial killers, serial, serial rapists, we can't just have them sit in these restorative justice set sessions and then just like set them free again. Um, I totally hear that and that's a completely valid concern. That's something that not a lot of abolitionists have really explored in, um, in a deep way. And I think that, um, I think the thing to remember is that those people are so few and far between that it really is harmful to justify an entire system of oppression based on um, those few people who are harmful to society. Um, because in the end, the thing that, that really drives me to care about this is that these are people that we're putting inside. They're people that have families that love them. They have children, they have mothers, they have fathers, they have sisters, brothers, grandmothers that believe in them and that want them to be happy. And it's just really hard to lead a healthy family life when you're in prison, you can't really interact with your spouse as much as you'd like to. You can't be a parent. And these people love their families. Um, and I've seen how people can change and how, um, how beneficial it can be to have people back outside um, that aren't, you know, doing anything wrong, even if they might have at one point. So I hope I was so quick. Um, I have some resources I'm going to send of just like maybe books that you might be interested in or podcasts and things like that. So I'll send that along. I wish I were there. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay. I love her. Um, our next speaker will be Jessica Remington Westover. And I will tell you about her. 
Jessica Ramington Westover grew up in Modesto, California and studied family life for her undergraduate degree at BYU. She's about to finish and graduate from her master's in marriage and family therapy and works currently at a center for couples and families as a therapist. She's passionate about helping people find joy and safety within themselves and their relationships. Also, she's my cousin and dear friend, and we love her, Jessica Westover. Okay, so yes, I'm talking about mindfulness and female sexuality. I um, have done around like 600 hours of therapy, and so I was trying to think like, what could I talk about that would be helpful for a group of people that I don't actually know? Um, and um, with it like being like a women's girls conference, I was like, these concepts are ones I think would maybe be more applicable to the females that I've worked with. Um, particularly, I, I see a lot of anxiety and depression and self-worth issues with females, and then also a lot of like misunderstanding about their own sexuality and what society is telling them about sexuality. So I wanted to start with mindfulness. Oh, well, let's go the other way. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So I want to start with an example of what how I like to explain mindfulness. So mindfulness is a way of like getting into the present moment. So being really aware or mindful of uh, what's going on right now. So <coughs> I have these two pictures um, because I like to explain it as like the difference between, um, so like this one, let's say this is a scary movie and it's dark and you're watching it by yourself and like you're home alone and then you hear something and like you freak out and it's like, so overwhelming and you're just really scared um, versus the difference of watching a scary movie when the lights are on and people are laughing and there's food um, it's a totally different experience uh, and so mindfulness is a way to bring in some of those other contexts sometimes when we're feeling depressed or when we're feeling anxious that's like the only thing we can focus on and it feels so overwhelming um, but then when we can bring in this mindful thought process of, okay, let's focus on my breathing, or what does it feel like to be sitting on this chair, or whatever. There's um, other things that we can experience that can help our experience with the anxiety or depression be less intense. So with that, I want to start off by doing a mindfulness activity with all of you guys. Um, mindful breathing. Just gonna all follow this. Close your eyes and rest your hands on your knees. Bring your attention to the touch of your body on your seat. Feel the weight of your body on your chair or cushion. Make sure that your back is straight and that you're comfortable. Take a few deep breaths. While you're breathing deeply, relax your shoulders, your stomach muscles, the muscles in your face, your hands, and your legs. Let go of all the tightness in your body. Now bring your attention back to your breath. Notice what it feels like as it enters through your nose, goes down through your throat, filling your lung, and back out through your nose. Notice your stomach and chest rise and fall each time you breathe in and each time you breathe out and just allow your breathing to be natural and relaxed. Now bring your attention to the feeling of your breath in your nose. Feel your breath as it comes in and goes out. Just focus on this sensation, paying attention to each time you breathe in and each time you breathe out. 
As you inhale, maybe your breath feels cool. And as you exhale, maybe it feels a little warmer. When your mind wanders, or if you become distracted, just notice what's going on in your head and then gently bring your attention back to your breath going in and out. Focus on the feeling of your breath and allow thoughts and feelings to come and go in the background. Now gently bring your attention back to the touch of your body on your seat and open your eyes. the benefits of mindfulness. Um, you can take a minute to like look over that. Um, but I'm sure as you're already just kind of feeling like there's, it, it's pretty like tangible how different it feels in your body. It can take some time to actually get all the benefits of mindfulness. Um, just like a sport, you don't get like perfect at a layup after one try. You have to train your brain to be able to um, really focus on that moment and um, get into your breathing and, and so I recommend it to all of my clients to do for at least five minutes a day. Um, I highly recommend it when people are having fights uh, for couples. Uh, it's a really helpful way to kind of take a pause and uh, calm yourself down and um, so yeah I think that some of the um, best things come from the improved well-being, improved self-esteem, less worries, deeper connection, um, the ability to be more fully engaged, but there's also physical benefits. As I've started doing it, I've noticed that um, I sleep better and um, less gastrointestinal difficulties and uh, less mental health. So I highly recommend mindfulness. There's an app that I really like called Insight Timer, and um, there are tons of different meditations on that and mindfulness practices, and it's free. So that's the best part of it. <laughs> Um, the next thing is a sexual um, intervention for um, couples or anyone can start trying this. It's called Sensate Focused. So it's along the same ideas of being in the moment and focusing on your senses. Um, so the first practice for that is uh, one that we often do, <clears throat> we can do like just, we could do right now if I had lotion. But you start, you pay, maybe put a little bit of lotion in the palm of your hand or on the back of your hand, and you just let it sit there for uh, like a minute or two, and you just start noticing all of the sensations about having that lotion just sit there on your hand. Like if it feels cold or um, how heavy it feels, and um, it's a way to really get your body to connect with your senses, because oftentimes we're just kind of like going through the day like, oh, I don't even remember that I'm hungry, or I don't remember that I'm tired, I'm just like doing this assignment or doing my work or whatever. And when we have that disconnection from our senses, it's really hard to then get in the moment when we're having a sexual experience um, because we've already disconnected our bodies from our sensations. Um, so I have the picture of a uh, massage. And so that's like kind of, it, this is a technique that you can do. You can kind of go step by step and increasing your um, interactions with your senses that you like would just um, get closer and closer to eventually having sex in a couple's relationship um, but starting with things that are, are basic to really reconnect you to your your senses so um, then going on to that this is a book that I really like I highly recommend it for anybody it's kind of um, liberal <laughs> So just keep that in mind, like, uh, if you're comfortable with that, I think it's still really great. Um, but so here are some of the seven principles of this book that I think are really important for everybody to know. Whether you're married or not married, um, I think for the future it's helpful to know uh, if you're not married because I think we have really unrealistic expectations um, of our sexuality and especially, I feel like, for women. we 
kind of take the general principles of male sexuality and apply them to women, and that's just not how it works. Like, our bodies are different, so why would our experience be the same? Um, so the first and, like, most important principle is that, like, there is a huge range of normal. So oftentimes, like, I feel like the main thing I hear from women is that, like, they have a sexual experience and they're like, something's wrong with me. Like, I didn't interact or I didn't respond the way that I thought I was going to, so I must be broken or I'm abnormal. And that's just really sad. I think, I think that's really sad because you're not broken. You're not abnormal. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, and uh, so just like being open to that idea that people are gonna have different experiences and figuring out what is gonna be your best experience. Um, the second idea that there's never going to be a pink pill, so like the idea of like Viagra, um, it just it works differently for females. You can send more blood flow to the vaginal area, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be more aroused. And there's also a misconception about how like erectile dysfunction medication work for males, but we don't have to get into that today. Um, it's not as magic pill as everyone thinks it is. So. Uh, Women haven't developed a very thorough knowledge of their own bodies. Um, I feel like I even fall into that trap. Um, I, in reading this book, I learned like different parts of my genitalia that I had been naming improperly. And I think it's really interesting that, um, so kind of the most basic one is that I feel like we refer to like the whole female genital area as the vagina, and it's actually called the vulva. And um, which is interesting because I feel like most people can very easily na name the male genitalia, like all of them, like scrotum, like uh, shaft. Uh, anyway, you get the point. <laughs> so um, we need to have, like, in order to understand what's actually going on with our sexuality, we kind of need to understand the basics of what it's actually called. Like, that's the first step. Um, so I invite you to learn that. I didn't want to like scar you by putting it up here if you weren't ready for that, but I think when you are ready to really educate yourself because that's important. Um, the next point is that desire for sex is very sensitive to context. So um, even if you've never had sex, you've probably experienced times in your life where you are more like driven towards physical intimacy and t other times where maybe you're more like averse to it and that's really normal like depending on your stress and your life context your desire for sex will change a lot so a lot of women come to me and they're like I just never want sex and something's wrong with me not true just a phase of your life and we can work with that so um, so there's a dual control model of sexual response so this author refers to it as like a gas and a brake pedal that there is um, a wide range of like sense sounds uh, touch, different things like that, that can um, put on like your gas pedal and make you want to have a sexual interaction. And then there's a wide range of things that will put on the brakes. Um, and so the key is finding the things that will maximize your gas pedal and get you to a place where you can have a positive sexual experience. Um, for a lot of people, there may be more brakes than gas right now, which is why they feel like they're having a negative sexual experience. Um, but the great point about that is point number six, is that you can learn these things. <clears throat> so um, if that's how you are right now, you're not doomed. Um, you can reteach your body to be um, aroused by certain things and let things that maybe have previously turned you off not be as, a, as much of a concern. Um, and then the last point is that there are ways to treat pain during sex. Um, a big part of that is that um, I think, I can't remember who was talking about it, um, with the, was it you who was talking about like how you have to be like relaxed when you're having a child or was that you talking about, okay that was you. So it's the same with having sex, like oftentimes this is like a point of stress and it's like, oh if I didn't have a good first experience then it kind of leads into this negative idea about yourself and sex and then every time you are going into that moment, you tense up, and then it's more painful, and it's not a positive experience, and kind of just leads to a vicious cycle. Um, so having that mindfulness and finding ways to like relax your body, those are really helpful, but also there really are ways to treat other kind of painful things with sex. So don't give up on yourself, either now or in the future. 
um, and uh, know that there are resources and that this is something we can talk about and it's not as awkward as it has to be and that's it. So thanks. Thank you, Jess. We love that. Um, very informative. Sandra Shirtliff recently left her position as executive assistant to the director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. She graduated from Brigham Young University with a BA in political science and a minor in Middle East studies. After graduation, she served a mission in Campinas, Brazil. She's worked as an office specialist and administrative assistant at both BYU and UVU. Sandra also taught seminary for a semester in Spanish Fork before deciding to return to BYU. She enjoys traveling, writing, speaking all sorts of languages, playing sports, and telling jokes. Her dream is to be a famous author, but she lacks the conviction to leave social settings and ends up giving overly impassioned speeches instead. <laughs> we will listen to that right now. <laughs> so I'm going to it. Right. Right. I uh, kind of uh, good notes. <laughs> like, well, I can't read, so this is good. All right, I was born with uh, a couple of like personal defaults that I need to become strengths as I am in very unusual situations like this one. First off, I have a very low voice, which I have seen put people to sleep, so I learned to kind of like hop around while I'm presenting, so I'm sorry if I'm like way over there somewhere. Um, secondly, I talk really fast, which is also really bad for comprehension, and once yes. I have to talk about so, it. <laughs> We're going to talk about false dichotomies and the problem of Syria. I'm obsessed with false dichotomies. I push the wrong button. I, uh, it's great. So first off, I could talk to you guys about the number of times that I've had this conversation with Maddie about what false dichotomies are. I can actually rant about it for like an entire hour. But here we go. What are dichotomies in general? That's like when you have two, you see everything like sort of a bi-dimensional two, like two option world, right? Where extrovert or introvert, you know, you're rich, you're poor. Everybody's one or the other. You only have one identity or the other identity. And that creates an us versus them mentality, right? That's all of racial injustice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Problem is, what is a false dichotomy? If there's true dichotomies that exist, <laughs> this is me as a teacher. <laughs> if there are true dichotomies, then there are also false dichotomies. So that means what happens is, if I can get this to work, there are only two types of people in the world, those who think in false dichotomies and penguins, right? So if you're getting what I'm saying, the problem with false dichotomies is you try to pretend that there are only two ways to look at something when it's actually very multidimensional, right? And it's multifaceted. And so that's actually the problem with almost everything in the entire world uh, for example, religion, right? There's only one way to live the gospel if you're not living in your center, right? There's only one way to do something. Everything in the world is formulaic. There's only one way to see politics. Either you're a liberal or a democrat, either you're a conservative or you're not. Anybody else doesn't exist, right? We've deleted people that could potentially become our allies because we started to villainize them by falling into this false narrative of a dichotomous world. So I promise I won't spend more time talking about that. No, I will. But uh, let's see. So the problem in my world, because I'm a political philosopher and it's what I do, in my free time when I'm like sitting there and I'm zoned off in like a social setting in the middle of catchphrase because I'm like lost in this world. Uh, <laughs> basically the problem is it leads to political mistakes. So a lot of foreign policy decisions, a lot of bad politician mistakes is because they're buying into these false economies and because that's the way that you get votes, right? And so everything in the world becomes this false narrative that we live and that's the way you get people to support you and you end up making really bad decisions. So, this is uh, how we have the problem with terrorism. So what I do is actually, my emphasis and my obsession, which is super weird, is how to get into the mind of a terrorist and understand what drives them, right? Which, you know, it's, it's not motivating, but. <laughs> so basically, this, uh, there's a book called The Media Relations Department of Hezbollah, which is your happy birthday. This is a very different topic than anyone's gonna talk about, but I just realized right now. Hezbollah is a terrorist organization in Lebanon and they came up with this idea, so I'm actually sure going to use them as a model, even though they're bad dudes that like kill children. They came up with this idea that if they wanted people to support them, they had to create an us versus them in which they looked like the good guy, right? And so they decided that if the country is going to be, you know, run or threatened by some sort of a dictator, then their opportunity would be to actually care for the poor. So, on one, so they actually have a media relations department, a public communications department. So you have your guys who go and blow themselves up with suicide vests, and then you have your team that's wishing you a happy birthday if you get on the subscriber list. I'm not your kid, right? So you're like, what? <laughs> so then if you're the people, and there's the dictator, and then there's the people who are like, hey, do you want a basket of food because you're in poverty? You know, you can either choose the dictator or you could support terrorism, right? And so actually what actually makes ISIS or whatever Al Qaeda or anybody here in the Middle East so attractive is because they're living in this world where actual terrorist organizations are really good at creating narratives. And so they actually create these narratives that make people think, you know, if you're a poor person in Syria, ooh, what are my options here? 
you know, how do I, how do I take care of my kids if I'm living in an oppressive regime and the international community doesn't own our country? How do I, how do I take care of my kids if I want to leave my country that's war torn and I can't get into another country as a refugee? Suddenly, terrorism becomes your only option, right? So that's what false dichotomies do, is they create false choices and people end up making a choice they wouldn't otherwise make. Insane. Okay, so now we get to Syria, which is my obsession. I'm going to give you a brief background just in case you don't know <laughs> about the Middle East. Which, okay. <laughs> in uh, 2011, there was this thing, the Arab Spring happened, which basically means every Middle Eastern country. No, we're going to go back farther. 1940s, whatever, there was this thing called World War II, right? And you have the whole Ottoman Empire falls and the World Wars, and so then you know the imperialist colonial countries come in, France, uh, Britain, the US, and they're like, what are we going to do now that the Ottoman Empire is gone? We have to sort of split these countries up. So they drew little lines, generally based on geographic region, ignored everything about what the citizenship actually looked like, what the religions looked like, right? So we created the countries that are in entire disarray, and that was an original problem. What we thought at the time, however, because there was Al Qaeda actually originated in like during World War II was they came out as these freedom fighters and they said, no, 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 we don't want to have like dictators in our country. We want to have free countries just like the Western powers. And they said, however, we also want them to be Islamic states where you know everybody has to follow extreme Islamism and women are oppressed, blah, blah, blah. So the Western powers thought if we support dictators, they will create stability in the region and we can influence them to have better policies. So historically, for years and years, what's it been now, 70 years, we have always, almost always, let's see if I can get this one almost always supported dictators because the other choice seemed like terrorists. So we fall into the same, na same narrative, right? You have to so uphold the dictator, otherwise the country's gonna fall into chaos. And that's kind of the idea. Now, that changed in, in the globalized world. Maddie Dunn talked about it, she's gone. No, there you are. Look. Uh, the whole problem with globalization and social media is that you cannot now believe that a random Syrian dude who's living in his little hut doesn't have internet access because he does, and he's watching Friends on the weekend. Right? And so you can't go to that guy and be like, this is actually your cultural world. Right? You live in a world of, of dictators, and that's it. You, know, you live in a world of extreme Islam. There is no such thing as freedom. No, they know what it's like. They know how Americans' lifestyles are. And so what happened was in 2011, which is not coincidental, because it's only like a year after smartphones got like worldwide and internationally, uh, people in the Middle East, the actual people themselves, started rebelling against the dictators. And they started overthrowing them, because they're like, wait a second, the rest of the world isn't living like this. Or we didn't know that before. So it happens in Libya, it happens in Egypt. Egypt actually is successful. They overthrew their dictator, great. They have a free country now. Uh, Turkey's done it. It's everybody, every country, basically. One of the problem countries was Syria. And Syria is, what happened was in 2011, they were, uh, what is it? There's 15 kids and they like, I think they played hooky at school. And they went to like the school building with graffiti. And they wrote all these like anti, the President Bashar al-Assad, they wrote like these anti-Assad things. And the President got so upset, he sent the military down and they threw the kids in prison. Uh, and then the parents came, and they were like, hey, let their kids out of prison, like, they're just kids, whatever. And the officials, the, the journalists, I think it was that recorded, the prison officials told the moms, uh, forget your children, and if you want more children, we can show you how to make them. And <laughs> that caused so many problems that actually, because all the other countries were already rebelling, war instantly broke out in Syria, and suddenly you have a functioning of the Free Syrian Army. And so they said, this narrative, this false narrative, is not true. We don't have to choose between terrorists and dictators. We can actually choose ourselves, right? Which is civil society. And so that was the problem. So now you have the Free Syrian Army trying to convince themselves that they're real. So this is just a map to basically show you what it looks like. This is actually updated. So the rebels are being defeated right now, if you're wondering. This is uh, all the red is Bashar al-Assad's territory. The yellow is the Kurds. We're going to go in there because it's complicated. These white areas right here are areas controlled by the rebels. It used to be bigger, but they've been losing so badly. Aleppo is right here. See, all of this used to be rebel controlled. Anyway, the point is, uh, U.S. doesn't like to get involved in foreign wars for like multiplicity of reasons. I don't need to tell you anything about history in that regard. But the problem is, if you're ISIS and this is your situation, you're freaked out that the U.S. is going to come in and support the Free Syrian Army because that destroys your narrative, right? You're like, oh, someone else is going to take care of the poor and we're killing children, right? So they have to convince everybody that actually the U.S. is obsessed with the dictator. Right? And so they have to actually tell people, no, 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 the U.S. isn't getting involved in the war and they're not letting in the refugees because they actually don't want to be free. Okay, so that's the narrative they're saying. Meanwhile, the dictator, Bashar al-Assad, is so worried that the U.S. is going to come in and help the Free Syrian Army overthrow him, so he has to convince everybody that the Free Syrian Army and the terrorists are the same thing. Right? You have to create a dichotomy, otherwise you're going to lose your point. So if you actually want to know what's going on, where ISIS is, these little black things, that's actual terrorism. 
blocks in the country, very, very, very tiny. But if you ask Russia while they're, why they are bombing civilians in the Syrian war, they will tell you because they're defeating ISIS, right? So you get what I'm saying? It's so complicated, let's move on. So basically, the point is, what? I'm stressing myself out. The point is, everybody has to create a narrative, and the US government comes in, and they are saying, do we choose the dictator? Do we choose the terrorist? Who are the terrorists? Are the Free Syrian Army the terrorists? I don't know, right? Everyone gets confused. The US does nothing. And the point is the international community is freaked out because Russia's like, no, it really is only dictator terrorists, and we're supporting the dictator because we hate terrorists. That's why we're actually bombing all of this, right? You know? And so it's like so confusing. The US does nothing. The point is you get screwed over the process. All the normal people in Syria who are doing normal things, who don't who aren't terrorists and don't care about their dictator and are actually just trying to live normal lives. I'll skip ahead just so you can see it. This, and when the war broke out in 2011, these were the top four Google searches for Syrian civilians. Arab idol, bodybuilding, summer fashion, and Miley Cyrus, right? I'm like, these are not people who are like, I just love, you know, Islam and worshiping temples and I don't know anything about the Western world. No, like they actually know everything that's going on in the Western world. And instead of people paying attention to their crisis, you have 13.1 million people in need, 6.6 .6 million displaced, 3 million in hard to reach and besieged areas, I'm going to give you uh, the total population of the country is 18 million. So that's a third of the country is gone, right? Or well displaced. And then in terms of death toll, which I'll get to in a second, well, so I saw something out of this the other day. The death toll right now is estimated between 370,000 and 570,000, meaning there are possibly 200,000 people that they don't know what happened to because they're not refugees, they haven't been registered, meaning they've been either crushed in buildings or completely obliterated in bombs, and we have no way to identify them. 200,000. So we have to guess where those people went. Probably dead, right? We don't know. Crazy. This is a before and after photo of Aleppo itself. Let's watch a little video about this real fast. It's 48 seconds, so it should be pretty. It's not graphic. You're welcome. <laughs> Websites because it was popular for half a second because everyone was freaking out that a Syrian child was found on the beach of Turkey dead and someone took a photo. So it was a big deal for like one year, right? And then everyone forgot again. So you can't even find that site anymore. It actually doesn't even exist. So I actually, it, because I pulled resources before because I studied it, I still had some of it, which is crazy. Um, anyway, point is when it goes to the refugee crisis, this is the problem you have. If you're creating an Islam versus the West mentality, which is what terrorism wants to do, you have the problem where anytime somebody comes and tries to come to the US as a refugee and we all debate whether or not they're actually terrorists, what the terrorists are going to be saying is, no, they don't want you in their country because they actually just really hate freedom and they hate you. And remember how we're going to provide freedom when you have a birthday? Perfect, right? And so all we do is fuel ISIS's narrative. All we do is fuel terrorist narrative every time we ignore foreign conflict. What? Yeah. So this is a quote. I won't tell you which political candidate this is. It's not one of the main two. <laughs> so whatever. From 2016. We cannot win the war against ISIS and cannot resolve the refugee problem without dealing with President Assad. The hardest way to come into the U.S. is as a refugee. ISIS wants us to deny them entry because if we do, we abandon our principles as a country and help ISIS fuel their narrative of Islam versus the West. The idea that the West hates anyone who is Islamic, even if they actually ascribe to a Western culture. Which isn't true, so it's a false narrative. All right, almost done here. Last thing, if it will change, which it may never. <laughs> There we go. So these are photos, just real fast. This is, uh, this is actually just in this one of the cities. I can't remember which city it is. And then this is refugees. They made it like way dramatic. I mean, that's actually a photo, but they like grayscale. It's like it's Instagram. Anyway, so this is from a blog post that I wrote. And so I apologize, it's not super intellectual because I was like emotional at the time that I wrote this. It's probably unfair. But basically about the refugee problem, I say it is not a problem because refugees are being ignored. It's because refugees are being created in an ignored conflict. It's because we ignore everything that doesn't find its way to our doorstep, clawing for attention before grasping its last as an actual victim in a real conflict rather than a falsified victim in a world of personally contrived rights. 
as if all that mattered was young love and paychecks in a world painted by the blood of the innocent. So passionate, overdramatic, too much. But <laughs> it's basically how I feel in the world because basically one of the things that drives me the most insane uh, and just kind of makes my message to leave you with is this idea that we, we really get so stuck in our narratives that sometimes we fail to see outside of it or what the world really looks like. For example, you know, we're so concerned, reasonably so, about like education in America that we often forget that education in Syria is, you know, five kids running to school in the midst of rubble, right? And so sometimes it's hard for us to kind of break outside of our world vision and realize that there are other ways to see people and there are other ways to see the world. Are there potential solutions, if I can do it, which I can't? Uh, discernment. This is, yeah, that's a quick story. <laughs> I have too much time. I was talking about it like five hours one day, which is normal. <laughs> I was ranting for five hours. Anyway, I like go through this whole thing and I'm trying to like lead up to this thing that I realized, which was discernment. And like before I could even finish, she goes, oh, discernment. And I was like, right. You took me down 30 seconds. It took me like 28 years. So basically the idea is discernment. And that's not just political, right? That's like spiritual, that's religious, that's in social settings. We can't look at somebody who disagrees with us and suddenly start to villainize them. Right, because suddenly you're creating an us versus them. So you're just as bad as anyone else in the world who's created an us versus them. Whether you're an imperialist or a racist or a bigot, anybody who tries to make the world dichotomous falsely to try and you know, build themselves up is creating a false narrative and you're actually becoming you know, what you hate, which is dangerous. Political discernment means breaking down stigma so that you can do that to make good policy decisions. So in the Middle East, we're making better policy. We're not actually thinking that there are only two sides to every conflict, because there's not. That's the whole Israeli-Palestinian problem. And then my imaginary dream ones, which will never ever happen because the world isn't simple like me, uh, <laughs> is the UN needs to kick Russia off the Council of Five because they've been vetoing everything and obviously they don't have the entire world's interest at heart. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I, I personally think should be rotated so that every country has an opportunity to be in the Council of Five. Uh, also redefining international response to crises instead of looking and being like, well, we can't do anything because Russia supports us. You know, Assad, we would come in and actually do what the UN was intended with the original Geneva Convention, where you actually get both, both parties into a room and you say, hey, the entire world is going to pressure you to resolve this conflict so that we can take care of people in crises. But right now we're too afraid to do that because it's going to look like military or boots on the ground or something freaky and no one like, wants to be involved if Russia uh, can veto it, which they can. So that's, my, that's uh, my thing. Basically, I'm saying, you know, don't get lost in a dichotomous world and make good life decisions when you care about refugees. So. Thank you everyone for coming. I do have a presentation that I'm going to give right now. So, Actually, but I just you. wanted to thank you who I am. I know who you are. I'm going to read it. Okay. <laughs> Are you prepared? All right. Madeline Hawkins, who you all know, is the fifth of six girls and grew up in Modesto, California. She studied Spanish translation as her undergraduate degree at BYU and is currently getting a master's in education policy. She has various big ideas about where her career path will lead her, none of which she is prepared to share at the moment. <laughs> In the meantime, she enjoys singing, climbing trees, laughing, eating treats, and staying up too late with her friends. That's true. <laughs> uh, before I say thank you, I did want to say thank you to everyone who participated. This is my dream in life, is to get all of my people together and share the things that we're passionate about. I feel like since, I feel like since uh, I have been young, I've just been surrounded by so many amazing women who have taught me things just in conversations that we've had. But it's been, I was telling my friends this the other day, it's been like me and my friend at 4 a.m. and she's telling me these things. And I'm like, why doesn't the world know this? Why, does it, why don't we have a venue where we can share these things with people and we don't have to be 50 years down the road into our careers, have all of the degrees? Because I think that we all have valuable things to contribute to each other right now. And so I'm just grateful that you guys were here and grateful that you supported it and that we have been able to teach each other. Um, and I will go into my thing. I'm going to talk about something that I love and have always been interested in, which is contingencies of self-worth, self-worth in general. Um, these three people, honorable mentions, Shannon Hawkins is my mom, Joanna Tiger is my sister, and Allegra Lund is one of my dearest friends who had a baby yesterday, so that's why she's excused. <laughs> but um, they individually and collectively have taught me so much about self-worth, either because of resources that they shared with me or just by their examples and things that we've discussed. So I just want to just kind of mention them. If you guys know them, you know that they have really um, studied this in their own lives and are really good examples of it. So contingencies of self-worth, this idea that that specific phrase comes from Jennifer Crocker, who's a psychologist, and she based her research off of some of the ideals of William James, also a psychologist, um, who look at self-perception and self-image and where confidence comes from. 
Uh, it's just fascinating to me. I've not necessarily studied this um, as professionally as probably Jessica or Lisa probably know a lot more about um, the backgrounds of these. But contingency of self-worth essentially means in this particular uh, research, Jennifer Crocker identifies seven domains of how humans define our self-worth. So it, we're saying if I am successful in one of these domains, I feel good about myself. If I'm not successful in these domains, I feel bad about myself. And everyone's going to have different things that we care about according to who we are and our experiences and traumatic events that we've had. Um, but we're just going to run through these really quickly. So for example, approval from others, a classic. We hear negative feedback from someone or we hear that someone said something unkind about us. It totally ruins our day. We feel bad about ourselves. We can't function normally because we just can't get out of our mind that someone would have something negative to say about us. Um, comparison and competition is basically saying that in any given situation, I need to be the best at what I'm doing in order to feel good about myself. No one else can be better than me or else it would shatter my worldview. Uh, physical appearance, an awful one, so sad and so, so irrelevant too. But we're saying if I feel bad about how I look in any way, it's going to determine the way I function. I'm going to be less like myself, I'm going to be less genuine because I'm worried about how I look. Uh, competence and intellect is kind of like the comparison one, but specifically having to do with our skills or how smart we are. So that can manifest itself in having to be right all the time. You can't let someone kind of prove you wrong in a conversation. You pretend to know more than you actually do. Um, family support is an interesting one. It's relationships in general, but specifically the sibling-parent relationships, where you can't move forward with a choice in your life without having that validation from the people around you. So I have to call my parents every day and make sure that they're on bored with me or I can't move forward with a choice if I feel some hesitancy on part of my parents or siblings. Um, more, I guess it's more apparent with like codependent relationships and families who haven't learned to differentiate themselves very well. Values and morals and God's love are kind of interconnected but also different. Values and morals is like I see myself as a good person, therefore if I make a bad choice or if I do something that I perceive as wrong according to my belief system, then I am no longer a good person. My whole my whole self-image is gone and I don't know what to base myself off of because I did something wrong. Horrible way to live because we're always doing wrong things. Uh, God's love is an interesting one. If we are a religious person or a believer, um, ever if we ever kind of entertain the thought that God doesn't exist, it shatters our worldview. Or if we think that what we're doing makes God angry, then we also don't know where to uh, base our value. So anyway, I think we can see that with all of those, it is not a stable base of our self-worth. That basing, it, it's never gonna hold up, basically. There's always gonna be something that gets in the way of any of these things being 100% successful in all those domains. So if we shouldn't base our self-worth off of those things, then what should we base it off of? And this comes from personal experience, uh, studying the gospel. I think it's everywhere in the gospel if, if we understand, um, or if, as we learn about the nature of God. Um, and I also think it comes out in some psychological and scientific principles as well. So the first thing, I guess the theme of everything, is that I think that self-worth should be based off of every human's inherent capacity to change, our ability to change, our ability to be better tomorrow than we were today. And even if we're worse tomorrow than we were today, we can be better in the future eventually because we're going through a hard time. Um, but just knowing that every person is on the same field because all of us have that capacity to change and that can't actually change. That's the only thing that's constant is that we are always able to learn and grow. And that no matter where our starting point was, even if those are different in any particular area, we can always, always be better. Um, sometimes we lose sight of this because the world is giving us incorrect messages and we have people in our lives or situations or any kind of maybe a long period of uncertainty or a traumatic event or a relationship that's toxic, things that would teach us that we no longer have that ability and that change the way that we see the world and our confidence in ourselves and in our, um, in our capacity to do good things. So this in human development terms could be uh, phrased as growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Um, you, I mean, you talk about that in child development a lot. Um, in a learning stage, if you have a growth mindset, you're not thinking, I'm already smart, I'm already good, I already know everything. And then if you do something that would contradict that, then all of a sudden you have nothing. Um, instead, you come at it with a growth mindset and you say, I can always be better, I can always learn something, and if I'm bad at it now, it's totally fine, I can learn it later. And if I don't want to learn it, that's also totally fine, I can not learn it later. But you're not kind of basing it off of um, things that are inherently in the fixed mindset that you, you already are that or you already have to be that. Um, I think it just puts us all, like I said before, on an equal playing field because 
we know that everyone is the same. Everyone's going to have different insecurities, so it doesn't matter what thing you haven't learned yet because we're not expected to know all the things. Um, yeah, I think it's repentance. <laughs> I think that all of the things that I'm saying um, are also so inherently connected to the gospel because all of a sudden we start to view God and ourselves in a different way, meaning it's not how many things I've done wrong and I can make up for, it's how many things I'm able to learn because who, I mean, who came to earth knowing anything? No one. So I don't know why we hold ourselves to expectations thinking that we were already supposed to have our major chosen or have it picked out or already know how to do relationships or already be kind in every situation and I shouldn't have done that because I, we just didn't know, you know? And even if you did know and did the wrong thing, that's also fine. So yeah, I just think that is um, actually the gospel. Um, some resources that I wanted to mention here, obviously Jennifer Carver, Contingencies of Self-Worth. These second two are, um, the second one is one that I've been uh, more recently interested in. It's actually an Instagram account called The Holistic Psychologist, and she talks a lot about reparenting and retraining our minds to see the world in this way if it is that we have been damaged or uh, kind of wired to think that we can't change. And then the assertiveness guide for women, which I have preached <laughs> to probably every single one of you. <laughs> I love the book, I love the woman, and I think that everyone should read it. I guess it's for women, but um, basically I want to give a quick background on just the way that our brains could maybe have uh, wired us to think. Um, I mean, it's hard to just tell ourselves, oh, I have the ability to change, so I'm going to be fine today. Um, and it's hard to remember that every day. So just as kind of like a, something that was fascinating to me as I learned more about this is that when we are in a phase of learning something new or, or also when we're in a traumatic event and our brain is kind of more in fight or flight mode and it's absorbing a lot of information really rapidly, um, those, the synapses that are connected to our neurons are kind of lighting up like red hot every time it hears new information. So this is the example that I heard um, of when, I, when this was described to me and I, it was instructive, so I'll use it. Imagine that you're six years old, your brother calls you stupid. You've never heard that before, and it never crossed your mind that you would have been stupid, you didn't think of how intelligent you were ever, and you're like, oh, it kind of lights up in your mind, and you're like, am I actually not that intelligent? And your brain is looking for ways to validate that information. Is it true, is it not true? You go to school the next day, you get your test back, you fail the test, and you're like, oh, it's true, I am stupid. And the myelin sheath covering that synapses, I mean, this is like going back to anatomy, we have learned these things at one point, um, I hope but your myelin sheath is covering that synapses and telling your brain, this is the fast track, this is the most efficient way to do it. When I have this specific trigger, that's the response that I'm gonna to go to because this is what I've been taught. So think about over the course of your life, the messages that you may have received, either during a traumatic time where your brain was just kind of like a little sponge and taking in things that might not have been true, or just when you were younger and you had, um, or you were, I don't know, in your first month on mission, or first month coming to college, or first month of marriage, in any kind of new phase where there's a lot of new information coming at you and you're trying to sort out which one might be true or not, um, you can teach yourself a lot of things that aren't true about yourself. And you can get yourself in this place where your brain is kind of working against you because it thinks it's being more efficient, but it's actually telling you the negative thing the whole time. Um, so a lot of studies will indicate that um, you actually need to have kind of a three to one ratio with the positive thought and the negative thought or the positive feelings and the negative feelings. So it's not just we have to have them be equal to know what's going on, we actually have to have three times as many positive thoughts to counteract the traumatic negative ones or the um, just untrue messages that we're receiving. So anyway, it just kind of backs up in my mind um, positive psychology, this idea of speaking to ourselves kindly that Athena was talking about and um, really also being assertive in setting boundaries that will shut out messages that are not true about ourselves. And we could talk about that for also a hundred more years about um, just kind of the appropriate levels of boundaries between us and other humans and how to be assertive in creating those boundaries. I think a common uh, lie that we tell ourselves or that we like to believe is that creating boundaries will distance ourselves from people when actually the opposite is true. It will increase our intimacy with other people if we're actually showing them who we are and actually showing them where we stand, what our needs are, what situations we like to be in. Um, that, that lets them know who we are. And um, also, assertiveness, just as a general definition, is not saying that our needs are more important than someone else's and being aggressive about it, but it's also not saying that their needs are more important than ours and I'm gonna let you do whatever. It's having our needs be just able to be in the same space. They're coexistent, your needs are just as valid as mine are, 
and we can both talk about that and we can both have that be true. Um, and I think that's just a necessary step in finding yourself, determining what your needs are, um, and then feeling confident about that. I think that doing that for other people as well helps us understand God and compassion more because we extend them the same opportunity. If we say to ourselves that I have these needs and I am an individual and that I can learn and change and grow, I can say that for someone else as well. And inherently, I mean, just automatically your relationships are enhanced because you're looking at them with the capacity to do good things and to learn and change and, and be a better person. And then when they betray you or when they do something wrong, it's not this end of the world thing. It's they made a mistake. I'm not going to let that get in my way or something happened to me. I'm not going to let that change my worldview of myself and go back to all those domain things. Um, I'm just going to say that was a hard thing for them and they did the wrong thing, but I'm going to learn to trust again and reset my brain and thinking the positive trusting thing. Um, all that to say, I really believe in people. I believe in people and I think that that's the way that God sees us. Um, it has been so instructive to me to have other people in my life view me this way so that when I have been in those periods of uncertainty or trauma that I am consistently, I'm going to cry, I'm consistently <laughs> reminded of my own capacity. Um, to be better and to do things. And I think that it's so important that we treat other people in that way because we have no idea what situations they might be in and what messages they are receiving and telling themselves. So just being that teacher or parent or friend or whoever who can be a listening ear and just believe always in the capacity of a person to do the right thing, I think is um, God's plan. And that's it. Also, shout out to Garrick and crew for filming this.